we went to the TNA house show today. We did, we did. It was fucking great. It was. Before I go into the TNA house show, while we're on the subject of TNA, I want to uh, read an email. I'm not sure if I can get through this entire email. It's from Matt Allen. He says, Brian says you decided to skip tonight's episode of TNA Impact to attend their house show instead. I decided to watch Impact and take some notes. Some of the notes are stream of consciousness writing as I was watching the show. Some of the notes are in a recap style. I hope you enjoy. Been a member of the website since the merger. Love the newsletters and more so the audio shows. Really enjoy you and Dave and you and Vinny. I enjoy the Adam and Mike Big Eye Nightmare the most because they discuss Japanese pro wrestling. Keep up the good work. It's Matt Man 1624 on the board. I'm going to read some of this since we're not recapping Impact. And this will bring Vinny and I up to speed since I plan on not watching this show. Okay. Unless there's HD of the beautiful people and Velvet Sky's ass, in which case I will, of course, make an exception. And even then, it would not be as good as what we saw tonight. Here are his notes. TNA prepares to shock the world once again with its collective incompetence on how to run a two-hour wrestling show. Shane looks old. Why did that lead the show? I was trying to figure out why Shane McMahon was on impact for a second. Was that important enough to start the show with? Match screen was up for less than five seconds. Starting with the match, I like that. Kiyoshi and Bashir versus Daniels and Suicide. Furthering their anti-Americanism. How do we know that Kiyoshi is anti-American? Why would Shane Douglas be on the TNA roster? No zip line. Boo! <laughs> Bell at 557. They're still going with the idea of unmasking Suicide. A guillotine leg drop is a transition move. Crowd doesn't care for any of this. Small fallen angel chance. Don West won't shut up. Daniel finally gets crowded into it for a few seconds. Daniel's clears house. Curtis Granderson will be at Slammiversary. Who the fuck is that? Baseball player. Better than when the Phillies were at lockdown and not mentioned. Dive to the outside gets no reaction. Suicide attack by four men. Ref doesn't see it for some reason. Shane is wearing a different shirt than in the opening. Match ended at 11-16. British Invasion is out for 10 seconds tops. Mike today asked rhetorically if anyone saw Lethal Consequences and Motor City Machine Gun. If you blinked, you missed them. Shane is out of shape. I'm seeing a trend here, by the way. Decent You Suck chant. Shane thinks that someone other than Mick or Jeff is making decisions above them. Wait, wait, is this still the same segment? Apparently. All right. Effective promo, but who cares about Shane Douglas coming back? A bunch of quotes flash on the screen about TNA during the Slammiversary commercial. Many are very true. JBL and Foley are in Foley's office. Foley hints at changing his opinion for a once-a-year title defense to four defenses a year. Oh, so last week they built up that he was only going to defend it one time a year. Now he's deciding maybe four times a year. So maybe they changed their mind about who was going to win. Kip, you didn't save your attitude era money? Kevin and the Survivor Chick entered the office. Foley met at Dixie and Spike TV, so he put Nash in a steel cage. What? What? Nash is only in it for the money. No shit. He'll receive four times his payout for the match? Nash will be eating steak tonight. Velvet cutting a babyface promo. Why? This She's is a the heel. Most, this is the most non-sober recap of anything ever. It's a nice video, but what the fuck? Saban hates the interviewer. Saban and Shelly are clearly heels. They all hate mask wrestlers. No more shape-shifting? I don't understand. I feel like I'm watching the show as I read this right now. <laughs> Four on one, huh? Couldn't they just beat up Suicide right now and find out who he is? 14 minutes of non-wrestling programming. Beer money, double suplex. Crowd didn't care that much. That's too bad. Don West was in good shape at one time in his life. That's a lie. Take team can't get along. Let's fast forward here a little bit here. That's I'm great... just realizing I could be talking for five hours. <laughs> yeah. Let's get to the end. Charmel is upset about Jenna again. Oh, nothing That's ever the changes. End. Main event time. Nash is old and slow as molasses. He's slower than Batista. But I haven't watched Raw recently. He's slower than Batista, I promise you. Joe has a mystery advisor. That would be Taz. Match starts at 1.24.04, nearly 19 minutes since there was wrestling. This is not a Six Sides of Steel match, but a lethal lockdown match. Nash is already exhausted. Joe broke a hockey stick on Nash. That ends it. I couldn't tell who was supposed to be the face or the heel in the match. Oh, this was a Nash versus uh, Joe Cage match. I see. Joe's face penis is made of magic marker. The opener was the longest match at 519. There was a total of 20 minutes and 29 seconds of wrestling by my count. I give the show a thumbs down. Barely built the pay-per-view in my eyes. Show was just horrific. And I don't blame Lance Storm at all for boycotting the show. There's your impact report, everybody. All right. Thank God we didn't watch that piece of shit. We chose correctly. You were thinking of watching it. I, well, I, I did not understand exactly when we'd be arriving back here. Yeah, well. I did not know there would be post-show festivities. 
There were. There were post-show festivities. Mm-hmm. We went and ate, actually. We had a very fine Italian dinner. Yeah. And uh, then we got here, and we were tired, and yeah, there's no way I'm watching that show. Oh, look at this. We've also got... Uh, I know we were reading the house show instead of the TV tonight, but I made this audio rip of the three best parts of Impact so you don't miss them. Now this, this is a fine, uh, I was going to say reader, but it's a fine customer. Feel fine, free to play it on the show A tonight. fine member of the Empire, I should say. All right, well, let's... Because uh... if there's one thing we love to do is to get uh, in- instant audio files and install them and download them and play them. Well, that's what we're going to do. We can do this all the time. That's what we're going to do here. Because it doesn't look like it's uh, all that long a file. It was only 2.6 meg. So, let's uh, let's play this fucker here. These are apparently the best parts of Impact tonight. I have to open it. Mm-hmm. They will be the three best parts of Impact. All right, here we go. This is opening in real player. Don, are you finally convinced, once and for all, for the very last time... That suicide is not Daniel. Mike, today you have got to get over this obsession that you've got with suicide and Daniel. I mean, it's going to eat you alive if it's all you think about. Obviously, look at him. It's two different people. Why would you think otherwise? My God, Mike. Obs- let it obsession go. that I've got after everything that I put up with for you for the past couple of months when it comes to how positive you were that it really was Daniels as suicide, now you're going to turn it around on me? If that's the way you see it, then obviously you're still obsessed with it. Let's go back to the action in the ring. If you... you see, Mike, threats are part of wrestling, you know? But you got to look at the person that's making the threats. This fat son of a bitch, he counts all of us, has been world champions before, been in this business 15, 20 years, and this fat son of a bitch is going to try us all out. He's going to calm down, calm down, okay? All right? He's fat! We like, I'm going to... about this. I don't care. I'll make him body. bleed. You know the difference, Mike, between Taylor Wilde and Daphne? Yeah, I guess I'm about to. Taylor Wilde's the kind of woman you take home to your mother. And then you leave her with your mother and you sneak out and you go hook up with Daphne. Wow. So where does that leave Awesome Kong? Hopefully at your house. <laughs> He's so happy about that one. <laughs> wow. Well, there you go. He's, That's the best of impact, everybody. He's fat. Someone needs to do one of those every week. Who was that? Was that the Dooleys? He's it was. Fat, says Scott Steiner. The Dooleys, we need one of those every week. A best of impact to play here on the show. And by the way, a note of that first little exchange between Don and Mike. When you're not watching this show and you're just listening to them, they have scripts, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to believe. It's true. But it, it comes through. All right. Now listen. What the hell is this? Okay. All right. Here's the deal. Um, talking about tonight's TNA house show, which I know everybody's been waiting for for the last 16 minutes and 40 seconds here. God bless Caden. I like Caden, but boy did he screw up my night. Uh oh. Actually, he didn't really screw up my night. It was just, it was such a weird. Okay, so here's the, here's the whole idea. Caden was going to meet me at six thirty. We were going to carpool to uh, Kent. Okay. So at six fifteen, I get a message saying I'm a, I'm in Kent right now at the show. This sounds exactly like something Caden Matthews would do. Fifteen minutes before he's supposed to meet me, he texts me that he's already there. Right. So I'm like, Christ, all right. So, of course, I'm driving, and I get fucking caught in traffic because I can't use the carpool lane because I don't have him anymore. So that threw off the plan. So then we get to the building, and uh, and we have second row. And uh, and he's supposed to be sitting with us. He never shows up. It turns out, instead of sitting in the second row, he ended up just sitting in the cheap seats to watch the show. After paying second row money. After paying $65 for a ticket. He didn't even sit in a seat. See, I paid $22 for a cheap seat and eventually ended up in the second and later the first row. You ended up in the second row because you took Caden's seat. Right. He paid $65 to sit in the cheap seats. Right. So that's all weird and wacky enough. I do want to publicly uh, give a a huge thank you to uh, Brent Seawert, who has been a subscriber like literally so long that I can't even remember. This guy, he may have had like the early issues, like before number one, perhaps, for all I know. <laughs> Your pre-zero issues? Yeah, but he invited us up. He had two empty seats in the front row, and he invited us up there. 
And uh, I was like, who are you? I expected some board name or something like that. And he was he for, he just said like a real name, Brent Seward. And it was like, holy Christ, I remember this from like 1995. So uh, he got his front row seat. He's a great man. So a, a huge thank you to uh, to Brent. And so anyway, at the end of the show, go to find Caden. And uh, his new plan is, hey, let's all go eat somewhere. All right, great. Where are we going to eat? Oh, there's this place called The Rock right down the road. Or The Ram. Or The Ram, whatever it's called. So it's like, all right, well, let's all meet in front of The Ram, and then we'll we'll uh, decide where to go from there or if we just want to go to The Ram. So show up in front of The Ram. You show up. Uh, Dan and Charles show up. No Caden. Hmm. All right, well, don't know what the hell happened to him. Let's go eat. We'll go to the Italian place because The, uh, the Ram is closed, except for the lounge. We wanted food. So we go to the Italian place and end up calling uh, calling Caden, and what does he say? Hey, we're inside the Ram! I don't know if they forgot their own plan, or <laughs> what happened here, but uh, he said, yeah, we're in the Ram. We just bought, we just ordered food. And I was like, well, we just ordered food. And he says, oh, huh. <laughs> And I said, well, how about this? Whoever's done first, come over to the other place. If we're done first, we'll go find you. If you're done first, come find us. He's like, okay, my phone's dying. And it hung up. So we ate our food, and then... It was uh, great, by the way. Oh, God, it was great. It was a great meal. We ate our food, and then we went to the uh, Ram, and uh, no Caden. So I don't know where the fuck he is. I don't know what his deal was on this particular day. But uh, I guess we'll get an update at some point down the road. But yeah, this was this was not Caden's best day. God bless the guy, though. I got booking ideas for him. When when they mentioned, uh, I, I believe it was Charles that said to Caden, his idea was to go to the Ram and have a booking meeting. <laughs> the only way to have a booking meeting at the Ram or any other bar like that is to have the booker alone with a bottle of liquor. Well, maybe that's what happened. Maybe maybe that would help. Who and knows? It was, was suggested. So I showed up a little bit late, but I saw about half of the opener, and the opener was Chris Daniels and Suicide in a number one contenders match for the Legends title. Now, I didn't realize how stupid this idea was until I'd actually written out the results on the front yes, page. Yes, yes. So let me get this straight. It's Chris Daniels versus the X Division champion, uh-huh. but that belt's not on the line. They're fighting for a shot at another belt. I Well, I... I'm did not, I miss something when I well, showed you, up late? You did. I'm not clear on this, but I believe it was for the X Division belt and a shot at AJ Styles belt. So it was like they had a grand title unification scheme here in Kent. Uh, that, it was like that was their goal. Anyway, inane booking aside... They, they had a fucking sweet match. They had a great opener, actually. They had a, a great little match. It went to a 15-minute time limit draw. I think that was actually the only match on the show where they announced even a time limit. Yeah, conveniently enough, yes. Yeah, and uh, but it was great. I mean, this was really, really good stuff. I was in love with the show from the moment I arrived. Yes. So the the uh, the, the, uh, <laughs> the the highlight. I should say the highlight because the match was the highlight. But before things got going, they had the they had the TNA entrance ramp, and they, they, it's, it's a it's a hockey arena, a small hockey arena, and they had the the thing kind of curtained off halfway through, and the show was over in the one half. And uh, <laughs> Daniels comes out through the main ramp, and there's a light show, and he's posing and slapping his hands with, slapping his hands with the fans, and he gets in the ring and he's climbing the ropes and posing. Meanwhile, I'm looking across the uh, across the arena. I see Suicide just, uh, like, walk past the curtain, and he starts nonchalantly strolling through an empty section of seats. Yeah. And it was just funny. This was his entrance. This was his entrance, and then when it was time for his entrance, his music started, they put a spotlight on him, everyone went crazy, and it worked. But just watching Suicide walking through an empty <laughs> empty section of seats in the arena, that was comedy. We estimated 800 people in That's the 6,000-seat building. 6,000 cut in half, so... <laughs> Considering it was cut in half, it would be 3,000, but then they open up the floor, so probably close to 3,500 or so. But, yeah, I would guess 800 to 1,000 people somewhere around there. Yeah. It, was, it was not full by any means, but it, I, I've certainly seen worse. There were more than 500. When I mentioned 1,000, anybody I mentioned 1,000 to laughed uproariously at me. So we, we all finally estimated about 800 people there. I guess we'll have exact numbers at some point. I, I will also say that... While the size of the crowd may not have been particularly impressive, 
the passion of these people. Let me tell you something about TNA. I, I guess I always knew this, but but it was it was made patently clear at this fucking show. Mm-hmm. TNA doesn't have a lot of of people willing to spend money on the product. Right. They got a million and a half people that'll watch TV every week, but they got about twenty thousand people around the country that are going to buy pay per views regularly. All right. The people that are willing to spend money on this product are the fucking most passionate people I've ever seen in my life. There was a guy. There was a a a, uh, a large black fellow that was in our section. In all of the years I've been going to wrestling, I have never seen a man so excited <laughs> about the wrestlers coming out. Yeah, I don't think you were there when when uh, when he got excited for the beautiful people. This man was probably about three hundred pounds, maybe two eighty. This is the dude in the red. Yeah. Okay. Red tank top. Saw, saw him later. Yeah. Red tank top, fat, about two hundred eighty pounds. When the music hit for the beautiful people, which was the second match, by the way, this man began jumping up and down. Now, I realize I, I write reports all the time, and something exciting happens, and I say, the fans were jumping up and down and screaming and hollering. It's it's somewhat of an exaggeration. I mean, people do at least leap out of their seats and then cheer. This man was jumping up and down. Picture Earthquake, when he used to jump around men before he ran and hit the ropes through the earthquake splash. Mm. That's what this man was doing, and he was pumping his fists and doing circles. I've never seen a man so excited. I've never seen children so excited. When you see children and Santa Claus comes out at the mall, you don't see children behaving like this. I never saw a man so excited. That's what these fans were. Mm -hmm. These fans were passionate. Yes. These fans were line crossers. This was crumbly as far as the eye can see. They had crossed all lines they could find. In fact, in fact, these people were so passionate that I believe if you put Crumbly in the middle of the crowd, even he would be in awe at what he was witnessing. Yeah. There was a level of excitement here I've never seen in a show. He, he would say, not what's wrong with these people, but he would realize that he has a long way to go in his own following. Yes. Crumbly, you are not the number one TNA fan in the world. God, no. You just the, aren't. I just saw fact, several hundred people who like it more than you. You are at the very least the 801st. Yes. Because I've seen 800 people that are bigger fans than you of the TNA product. So anyway, the second match was uh, Taylor Wilde against Angelina Love, but Angelina came out and said, you can't face me until you beat Velvet. If you can beat Velvet. First off, the Beautiful People's entrance was, in fact, quite beautiful. Mm-hmm. They uh, came out, they did their little dance, they cut a promo, looked great, and then out came uh, Taylor to... What did she come out to? It was not her ring music. It was oh, like, God, what was it? It was... Uh, I forget now. Something completely different from her ring music. Like Matt Morgan came out to... Uh, His Ohio Valley song. Yes. And which is also the song his first TNA music was a ripoff of. But yeah, Taylor Wilde, I forget what it was now. It was something completely different. Just some random song. Some random pop song. This is going to drive me nuts. What the hell did she come out to? I don't remember. I think we should move on. I touch myself. That was not it, but we'll go with it. May as well have been. So she came out. That's going to be a drop, by the way. I was going to say. So she came out, and, and her and Velvet had a match. God bless Velvet. She's a very beautiful woman. She's a bad pro wrestler. Yeah. Actually, you know what? I can't even say that. Let me let me rephrase that. Velvet Sky is actually a pretty damn good pro wrestler. Her offense and her her defense, I guess. <laughs> her, her, Except for when she's on, she's attacking or defending, that part sucks. The her, rest of it's good. Her mechanics are horrible. Yes. Like when she kicks, when she punches, when she does moves, when she takes bumps, when she sells. She's very very yeah. green. But she's a great heel in the ring. She's a great performer. She's a, yeah, she's a great she, performer. She has fantastic in-ring charisma and presence. Yes, great performer, great presence, that sort of thing. Anyway, she lost to a small package, and there were some mistimed spots. And even the hardcore TNA fanatics, they can only take so much. There's a spot at the end where Taylor went for a high cross and Velvet was supposed to move. This was all Velvet's fault, by the way. Velvet moved like a good second and a half before Taylor even jumped. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the fans got on her for being so stupid to have still jumped. But, anyway, she small-packaged her for the pin. Then we got Angelina against Taylor for the uh, women's title. 
So uh, Taylor worked twice, as did Chris Daniels and Suicide. Uh, so if you're wondering, well, I'm going to get into that later. But anyway, they had, a, they had another, it was a fine little match. Nothing really wrong with it. Angelina ended up beating her. I don't really remember the details, except it was, that it was uh, not horrible. Ve- it was Velvet either interfered or distracted Taylor or something, and then Taylor turned around and ate a, like a bicycle kick. That's right. It was the, uh, the was big... Like, she hit the carbon footprint. She did. <laughs> that was a strange finish for her to do, but I really didn't care because I got to see Angelina in those tights, pants, I don't know what you would call them, but they were uh, amazing. Well, the whole the whole package was amazing. It was, uh, uh, yeah. Thumbs up. Thumbs up so far. Uh, Indeed. Thumbs up, yes. Then we had Eric Young and Matt Morgan. And uh, Eric Young on TV, I guess, is a heel. So he got got a a mild smattering of booze when he first came out, but he very, very quickly uh, got the crowd on his side. Uh, We were talking, actually. Dan uh, Dan Adam is a a referee around here. He's been on the show a couple times. Longtime friend of mine. Dating back, actually, to the... the, uh, the Bash at the Beach in 1995, one month after I started the newsletter. We went down together for that show. And big fan, referee, and we're talking about the, the one infamous show uh, a couple of years back where Matt Farmer and Chris Del Sol faced the Naturals mm-hmm. in that debacle of a match. The worst match we ever saw. And we were talking about how they uh, they had like a downstairs area in this building and an upstairs VIP area. And I can't remember how... We got VIP tickets, but we did. And the VIP area was upstairs with, like, free alcohol and, like, a a seat in the balcony or something like that. Anyway, the point is, we were the only people up there. Mm -hmm. Like, the only people up there. There were no other fans up there. So, of course, all the wrestlers ended up going in there to watch the matches. So it was was us and the wrestlers in this room. And the one match that every wrestler watched and marked out for was Eric Young's match. Yes. Now, for those of you that have only seen the goofball Eric Young on TNA TV who kind of has goofy matches and acts like a geek and, and shit like that. You have not seen the real Eric Young. No. I have seen Eric Young live now twice. He has been fucking phenomenal both times. He is he's just so great. Yes. He is such a great live event pro wrestler. And he had a fun little match with Matt Morgan. Morgan got the heat the whole time, basically. And, and uh, Morgan ended up getting the win with just kind of a Death Valley driver out of nowhere. which was I see Eric Young did. Eric Young, yeah. Yeah, you said, I thought you said Morgan, but no, yes. Eric Young hit a Death Valley driver on him, and, and uh, it just was so goofy. Because, like, there's a seven-foot giant beating on you the entire match, and then Eric Young hit him with a DVD and pinned him. Right. It just looks completely phony. It- but aside from that... <laughs> I mean, this match was was uh, really good stuff. Morgan is like, he's never really improved from when he was in Ohio Valley. I mean, it, it, he's one of those guys where you look at him and you think, this guy should be a main eventer in WWE. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, seriously, after all these years, you're still at the level of Ohio Valley. He is the same guy. I mean, there's a reason you're doing mid-card house show matches in Kent, Washington, losing to Eric Young. God bless the guy. I'm sure he's a great guy. But he never picked this business up. No, he he. I should I should not be able to do anything better than anyone in TNA. But for sure, I take turnbuckles better than Matt Morgan. <laughs> well, just wanted to make that clear. But uh, yeah, Eric Young, we've seen him twice now. The first time he was the uh, sort of comedy cowardly heel. Tonight he was the plucky underdog against the overwhelming giant, and he was awesome both times. He I, he's just so smooth in everything he does, and and and. and they have him on TV as you know for, for most of the past two years. He has been wacky comedy guy uh, as he heel and baby face, and now apparently he is going to be surly, angry, resentful, whiny guy. And it's like just let him wrestle, please. He's really, really, really good. There were being in the front row. I got a chance to to uh, see a lot of these guys, obviously up close, and TNA has some. Awesome workers. God, yes. There were there were only six matches here, but Christopher Daniels, awesome worker. He is the he. he yeah, um, I, 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 it's not that I I didn't really appreciate how really great he was until watching him go twice tonight, and and and, and watching him up close and and how he works, how smooth he is, how easy he is, how how much he makes the other guy look good, how safe he is, how much he takes care of everyone. He's outstanding. Chris Daniels, awesome. AJ Styles, awesome. Mm-hmm. Awesome professional wrestler. Jeff Jarrett is 
at 40, still very, very great. Yeah. Not like the best worker in the world or anything like that, but he is quite great. Beer money, so fucking phenomenal. Yes. These guys are awesome workers. Like, just, I was in awe at how great these two guys were. What the fuck are these guys, no offense to TNA or anything like that, but, I mean, WWE, what the hell are these guys not doing semi-main eventing in WWE? They are so great. Don't know. And uh, th- those were like the real standouts. Team 3D was, I don't know, I, I, I mean, they're, they're not bad. I would never call them bad. They're, they're good. But I, I didn't watch them and think, boy, you two are world-class workers. No. They're just good guys that don't hit you very hard, that are, that are solid, good tag team wrestlers. They really, they really, really know how to wrestle on a house show. Sure. And this was a house show, and they were great. And there was a moment where uh, when they got the heat on Devon, the heels did in the, in the main event, and Bubba Ray was trying to fight through the ref. And he proceeded to do the best bad wrestling you've ever seen in your life. As he, he, he sort of, I don't know, I don't even know how to describe this. He kind of half speed threw his fists in the air and walked back and forth and half ass tried to get around the ref. If we had seen this on TV, I would have been outraged. At a house show, it ruled. <laughs> yeah, they're not like, I, I wouldn't put them as like, I wouldn't classify them as like real great world class workers, but they're very, very good. And I mean, if you're going to go to a wrestling school, I mean, I, I would go to Team 3D's wrestling school. Sure. I think they could teach me how to be a really good wrestler if I had never been in this business before. And um, I would work with them. I would work with Jeff Jarrett. I would work with Beer Money. I would work with uh, Daniels. Chris effing Daniels. Not Chris. sure about AJ and Suicide. <laughs> I wouldn't want to match with Suicide. AJ, I think, would, would try to script way too much of it, so I don't think I would want that match. I would. Eric Young, yes. Yes, yes, certainly. Matt Morgan, it would just be too absurd, the size difference. I would actually pay to see you wrestle Matt Morgan. <laughs> and, uh, but, yeah. I'd wrestle Velvet Sky, too. I would. I, I don't I even know how to respond to that. I except, would. Except that, <laughs> except that I would after you. But, yeah. That's disgusting. <laughs> We're talking about wrestling here. Disgusting, man. So, anyway, uh, yeah, a lot of good workers on this show. That led to the fifth match on the show. It was AJ, Daniels, and Suicide in a three-way. This was fucking great. Yeah. This was... You know, it, it's uh, we, we mentioned how great Chris Daniels is, but I'm thinking back, and some of the best house show matches I've ever seen in my life have involved Chris Daniels. <laughs> I, I uh, God, what was the match? It was years back. I only remember Daniels. It was Daniels and uh, Mikey... What the hell was his last name? That's... No, yeah. Mikey uh, Henderson. Chris Daniels and Mikey Henderson. I saw this, like, almost 15 show? years ago. Yeah, it was forever ago. No, it was even before that. It was, like, on a on a local, like, one of those wacky shows that they used to do at the Armories. And he faced uh, Mikey Henderson. And up, up to that point, it was the best live match I'd ever seen in my whole life. And, uh, and this was also, this was one of the best live matches I ever saw. Yeah. Well, I, I, let me think about this. It was for sure the best non-televised match I've ever seen. It was in the top 25 of, of live matches I've it ever seen. It was really, really great. I've been great. to a lot of great ROH shows and some WrestleManias. Yes. But as a three-way, this was this was quite awesome. And, uh, you it know... It would be the best match on a typical pay-per-view. Yeah. So uh, when they announced that, that it was going to be a three-way, and what they did was, when it went to a draw, they polled the fans as to who you wanted AJ to face. The fans all chose Daniels. It was well, but, like, not all of them, but the majority. Sure, there were some that chose probably. suicide. But yeah. so anyway, it it um, they ended up saying it was going to be a three way, and I went boo because I just wanted to see Daniels and AJ. No offense to suicide, but I wanted to see Daniels and AJ. Well, suicide more than held his own in this match. Yes, he um, he did a great job. Daniels and AJ were just awesome, and uh, AJ ended up getting the pin and retaining the. Legend's title, and he cut a promo, putting over how he's not a legend yet, but you become a legend facing guys like Suicide and Daniels. I don't know what that means, but the people liked it. Whatever. It gave them an excuse to all three raise each other's hands, and uh, and then the two champions lifted their belts, and everyone screamed and chanted, that, that was awesome, and thank you, and it was good, good, good fucking times. I cannot believe how hard these fuckers worked on a house show in Kent, Washington in front of 800 people. Yes, in front of a 25% capacity crowd. When uh, when Brent asked if um, if we wanted to move up to uh, the front row, uh, I was like, I don't know. 
I, I what I mean, I kind of thought it was a trap. Because at first I didn't know who he was, you know what I mean? Just a guy. Yeah. He goes up to you and says, hey, you want to sit in the front row? And, and, and I got some candy. I thought, maybe this is like, um, you know, what if this is Keith Mitchell? He wants to put me right here in the front row and there's going to be a huge dive spot and they'll wipe me out and kill me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one who had paranoid thoughts all night. Well, no, I just I just did it that uh, that moment right there. But um, anyway, so so he calls us up there, and sure enough, there was a fucking dive spot right in front of us. But uh, thankfully, it didn't uh, it didn't go into the front row. Well, yes, I, I was. They had the security guard there, who was basically sitting three front of, three feet in front of me, staring at us, the crowd. He has back to the ring, and I could see they were setting up for this dive. And I thought, if they do this dive, this young man here is going to die. They're yeah. going to hit the guardrail and kill this man. And so I started, like, pointing behind him, and my eyes got big, and I was like, dude, they're going to do a dive. And they hit this dive, and I, I believe it was uh, it was Daniels coming down on the suicide. And he hit, like, a, a, a springboard moonsault, I think, but he, he comes down on this dive, and they're coming down to the guardrail, and he just landed light as a feather. He didn't, didn't, like, tap the guardrail for show. And then he climbed over it, and he came into the crowd, and everyone cheered and went crazy. I was more concerned when A.J. whacked his fucking shin into that thing. We thought he was dead. A.J. did whack his shin into the guardrail. Uh, thankfully, his shin pads are effective. He didn't even sell it. Apparently, he hurt his toe. Oh, that sucks. That was the uh, word after the show. Mm. But anyway, that was uh, that was just uh, fabulous. And then we had the main event, which was 3D and Jarrett against Beer Money and Sheik Bashir, which was a really fun tag team six-man main event. Uh, just a great house show match. Everybody worked hard, and uh, yeah, they did all the comedy spots with Beer Money in the beginning, which was great. Which was all great comedy. Yeah, and uh, the finish, of course, was Sheet getting put through the table for the uh, pinfall, and just just great. Yeah. I mean, I I was so in love with this house show. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody I talked to was like, "Why am I fucking watching Impact every week? That god awful fucking show." And here I am at this house show, and it's like one of the best house shows I've ever been to. Right. What is wrong? We know it's wrong. We know it's wrong. Stop the bullshit on the TV show. God, I wish I could just go to a house show every week and always skip Impact. I would be the happiest. I would have crossed the line so long ago. I would pay every week. God, this was great. I don't know if I'd pay every week. Let's not let's not go nutty here. But That's a write-off. So then afterwards, they... Uh, oh, and by the way, i got to talk about Borash. Yes, we do. Jeremy Borash is just so awesome mm -hmm. at being Jeremy Borash. Yes. He's such a shill. He is the new, I don't know we said this before, but he's the new Gene Okerlund. It's like he's, he's, he's just, he's, he's the perfect amount of slimy. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where, where you're madly entertained by him, but he's not quite slimy enough where you want to throw tomatoes at him or shit like that. The stuff, I mean, this was just great. They were they were doing the thing where text here and you may win a chance to go backstage, which I think was all a scam. I think they just wanted you to sign up for the thing because I don't, I don't know if anyone even got texted that you win, you're going backstage, because I think they had another scam at the end where they got everybody in the ring. But he was doing all this text bullshit. He did this deal where he said, um, we're going to put you all live on impact right now. Because, of course, the, the pay-per-view was head-to-head -head with Impact. So he had everybody stand up, and he got the cameras, and he zoomed around the ring with the camera, and everybody's whooping and hollering and that sort of thing. And I'm thinking, this is bullshit. We are not live on TV right now. This is a blatant lie. <laughs> but everybody there bought it, and so they had so much fun. Um, what else do we have? We had the uh, the deal at the, the end of the show. Oh, no, we had the other one, the other classic one. He goes, we had no idea you people in Seattle would be so awesome. And everyone's going, yay! And he goes, I just talked to somebody backstage, someone very high up. And they say that the next time we come back to Seattle, it may be a pay-per-view. And everyone goes, yay! And I thought, bullshit! Yeah. You do that every fucking show! You liar! <laughs> but it was just, they were such carnies. I mean, I, I can't even get mad at it. Here's why. Here's why I can't get mad. They were completely, utterly full of shit and lying. But it didn't hurt anybody. You know what I mean? Okay. No, nobody knew that they weren't really on impact, and it doesn't affect their life one way or the other. It did affect their life actually. They thought they were on impact, and it made them happy. And it made them happy. Yes. So great. <laughs> Who gives a fuck? 
This is where you where you say something's going to happen, you pay for it, and then they fuck you. That's something totally different. This is like when you when you tell a child Santa Claus is going to bring you whatever gift you want. And they wake up on Christmas morning and the gift is there and you say, it's from Santa Claus. And the kid goes, yay, I love Santa. Bullshit. But the kid's happy. How dare you. It's the kind of lie you tell to a little kid to make them happy. <laughs> exactly no what they did. better analogy for the TNA fan base than a bunch of little kids on Christmas morning. Hey, if you'd have been there, you'd, you'd understand everybody. I was there. This I, is exactly what this yes. was. But it was one bullshit line after the other. And then, of course, at the end of the show, Borash is like, we just came up with a great idea. <laughs> like, spur of the moment. Yeah. What we're going to do, instead of... Having some of you go backstage, we're going to bring the wrestlers out here. We're going to bring the backstage to you. Because you fucking people are so great. We're going to have them come out here. And the wrestlers came out to go around ringside, and he said, and there's more. We're going to give you, I know there's some, what do you call them? There's got to be fans. some super are fans here. Are there any here. super fans here? I know there's some Yay! super fans in this building. That's right. Yay! Super fans. So... He goes, what we're going to do... This is the best line ever. Make a line right here. We're going to give you the opportunity for just $20 to get in the ring with Team 3D and get your picture taken with him. Actually, here is what I say is the greatest line. His exact terminology was, pictures for Team 3D, first come, first serve, for, yeah. 20, for $20. Yeah. <laughs> they, were, they were doing us a favor yeah. by making us pay $20. Only twenty dollars, though. Now, this is a picture with the Team 3D, Brian. Brent estimated two hundred people. It was a long effing line. Two hundred people. Now let's think about this. Two hundred people, twenty dollars a pop. That's four thousand dollars in cash. They almost doubled their fucking gate, I would bet, <laughs> with this this little scheme that they had going on here. Sure, but and, I mean, it was and just... again, the people who pay the twenty dollars probably walked away pretty damn happy. Well, here's the other thing, though. For your twenty dollars to get a picture with Team 3D. You don't even get a picture. You have to go to TNAWrestling.com, and your picture is on there to download. I, I, I think, and there was a lot going on, I think they also had a printer at desk side. Oh, I didn't see that one. But anyway, the they, point they, is... They were pushing the website hard. The point is they, they made a shitload of money off this little gimmick right here, so, mm -hmm. so more power to them. Yes. We were wondering how they made money doing these tours, and, and this is apparently one of the big ways right here. Sure. But anyway... Well, I, I love the way they set it up, too. You talk about them being carnies. And, you know, they do this every show, but the, the main event's over. First of all, they had the shards of the table, and they, uh, they found a kid who had TNA shaved on the back of his head, and they autographed a piece of the table and gave it to him. And they said, well, usually we only give away one piece of the table. And right there I'm thinking, um, bullshit, it's a broken table. It has no purpose now. You may as well give it all away. But they, they found a soldier, and they gave him the second piece of the table. That was very nice. And then they said, uh, as Boris came out, he's giving the speech, trying to wrap up the show, and... Team 3D goes to leave, and Boris says, wait a second, you guys. And he talks, talks talking about super fans or whatever, and Bubba looks at Devon, and Devon looks at Bubba, and they both shake their heads and, you know, gesture towards the back and go to leave again, and Boras sees him and says, whoa, 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 wait right there. And it was so hokey, but well, fun. <laughs> it was like, I mean, the whole idea was they tried to make this like, we're so special yeah. that we're only doing this for you, Seattle. Right. Which of course is bullshit, but who cares? It was it was fun. Everybody had a great time. I mean, this show was like every thumb that I've ever had up. Yes. It was it was fun. It was wacky. It was goofy. Everybody had a good time. And uh, in fact, at the end of the show, who was in the ring there uh, arranging the snapshot, uh, Delia Bob? But one Dutch Mantel, true, looked two hundred years old, but he still had a fucking great beard. It was, it was not the beard you've seen, but it was a great beard for this century. And uh, our buddy Charles, at the end of the show, as we were about to leave, was like, "I got to get a picture with Dutch Mantel." <laughs> he may have been the only person in the building that actually recognized him and asked for a picture because I guess Dutch was so happy to give it to him. Dutch looked pretty thrilled to be taking a photograph with a fan. Yeah, this was. You know, the thing about this show is just like you see all these guys. You know, you see Dutch and you see Jeff. And it's like, on a day like this, it's impossible to hate these people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But Impact's going to come next week, and the show's going to be so goddamn horrible. No, worry about it then. And Jeff's going to be talking about his dead wife and his storyline, sure. and I'm going to hate him all again. That's but for tonight, it was like, the show was so great. Yeah. Everyone worked so hard. These fucking guys worked so goddamn hard, and it was impossible to hate TNA. Yes, I, I, I knew... 
Think, I was thinking about it on the way home, about the kind of absurdity about making the X-Division champion fight for a shot at the Legends Championship. Who cares? Exactly. Who gives a shit? I saw... Who cares that the referee stood there and watched as the table was brought into the ring of the main event and used in the finish? Who cares? Everyone loved it and had fun. Plus, the show, I was a little bit late. I was hoping they would start late like an indie show, you know, because people stuck in traffic. Like myself, they started at exactly 7 o'clock. The pinfall in the main event, exactly on the dot, 9.30. Excellent. It was an exactly two and a half hours long. There was a 15-minute intermission. So, you know, we got we got like two hours of straight good pro wrestling. Mm-hmm. So, anyway. There was not a wacky skit to be seen. Anybody listening to this right now, fuck Impact. Yeah. Don't go to the Impact tapings. Just do us all a favor. I don't even think you need to bother even going to the pay-per-views. Because we, we still get negative reports sometimes about the pay-per-views. But if there is ever a TNA house show in your neck of the woods... Drop what you're doing. Fucking go. Go. Just go. A guy there had a sign saying he drove like 300 and some miles to see AJ. I can't, that's a little high, but 150 miles, I'd say sure. Well, there's Abbotsford tomorrow. Well, we'll see what's going <laughs> <laughs> Vince is not going to Abbotsford, everybody. There, there's also the border there, which is a deal breaker. That's right. I don't have a passport either. But anyway, yeah, uh, when I first saw that sign, I was like, well, you're a dipshit. Then when the show was over, it was like... Bargain! <laughs> you do it again! I wonder if you went to Kennewick. You may have. So anyway, that was the show, everybody. and uh, Thumb was fucking up. It was awesome. And got to see all our friends there. It was a good time. And, uh, yeah, I have nothing negative to say about this. This was, like, uh, uh, just a completely positive, fun experience. And we had a great dinner afterwards. So, uh, yeah, it was great. Mama something in Kent. Yeah, happy uh, Mama Citas, I think. Something. It was Italian. I don't know. But, anyway, it was uh, it was great. So, drop what you're doing and go to a teenage house show the next time they're in town. Immediately. Yep. To the back! Just fuck you. Uh, remember when we used to actually care about Good this times. show? We used to care enough about this show to actually get mad at it? Back in the day. Boy, I, I do not give a fuck anymore. No. I mean, let me tell you how I watched this show tonight. I just turned it on, and then I started doing other stuff, and I kind of watched, and I took some little notes here and there. I, I didn't even try to figure shit out. No. I just, I so did not fucking care. And uh, and uh, it's been great. <laughs> I know. It's not been great. No, it's been great. I mean, I, I did not get... There, actually, there were a couple things on this show that still <laughs> that still tried to get me angry. But nothing did. Because I just don't fucking care about Impact anymore. I, it's not worth it. I'm now 34 years old. What am I getting mad about a TV show for? We could stop watching it. Eh, we should still at least observe it. <laughs> Watch it as something different. I see. You know what I mean? We don't need to investigate it. I see. We need to w- maybe witness it is we a better term. We don't need to examine it. Sure. Really? So let me let me go through my notes here. All I'm just right. going to tell you, and, and you know what? I know people are going to, this happens every time you're going to read your notes verbatim. I could, but I'm not going to. Pe- people are going to go into the thread, they're going to explain what we missed and what we didn't see and how stupid we are. Fine. Don't bother. Don't. I don't give a fuck. You're probably right. I do not care about this show anymore. No. Don't bother going in there and saying, Brian, quit being lazy and do your job. No. I'm not going to. I don't like this show. This show is is worthless. There's no reason for me to watch this show. You're not watching the fucking show either. And if you are, what do you need me to tell you what I don't know about it? 
So just shut the fuck up, listen to the review, and if you don't like it, too damn bad. Go to PWTorch.com or PWInsider.com or read the front page. I'm sure there's a recap there that has more of a clue than I do. So Foley came out and cut a promo and uh, started talking about how last week something had happened to Earl Hebner and his mouth was now wired shut. And apparently Jeff Jarrett was involved. I don't know if they had a video package. I didn't see one. I, I don't know what happened to Earl Hebner. I don't care. We missed one week of the show, and I sometimes felt like I missed six months. So it was just amazing to miss one week of the show and, like, have absolutely fucking lutely no idea what's going on. <laughs> I mean, no clue in the world what is happening on this show. If I missed Raw for a week, I'm pretty sure I could jump right back in and, and not feel like I missed a whole hell of a lot. Remember, you missed one week of Impact, you may as well have never watched this show in your entire life. Remember back in, in, in Cornette's OVW where you could have never seen the show before? Yeah. And everything would make perfect sense to of you? Of course. Yes. This is not that company. So anyway, something happened. God, no. And uh, Foley ended up calling out Jarrett. And he, he said that uh, Jarrett was such a dick for beating up Earl that he was um, finding and suspending Jeff Jarrett. Today said this was an overreaction. I'll take his word for it. Jarrett said that he was not going to stand there and let Mick make a farce of the company said this comedy act was over right now. And Foley said this was no comedy. He said Jared had endangered the life of Earl Hebner. This was no joke, and he was going to pay. And Jared was insisting, no, you've gone too far. Now, having not seen last week's show, I have no idea what happened to Earl Hebner. They didn't bother to tell us, except that Jared did something. All I can say is, when watching this, I was on the side of Mick Foley. Jared apparently beat up this man so bad that his mouth was wired shut. So, yeah, you should be fined and suspended. So, anyway, I think Jarrett was supposed to be the baby face here. Sure. But, anyway, they uh, Jarrett uh, Foley said you can do this the easy way or the hard way, and so Jarrett said the hard way. So, Foley has the fat security guys there. Right. And they beat up Jarrett, and then Jarrett made his own comeback, mm -hmm. and Foley said, okay, I will single-handedly throw you out myself before the night's over. Yeah, there was a lot to take in here. Uh, I don't know what happened to Hebner, don't really care. When uh, Jarrett said he was not going to stand for Foley's comedy show... Foley said something along, along the lines of, this isn't a com comedy show, here's a comedy show. And then he began to quote obsc <laughs> obscure lines from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, a film, Brian, that is almost as old as you. Impossible. Nothing's that old. I, it's hard to believe, but cellulite, the cellulite film has been around for that long. And uh, and cellulite. <laughs> sure. <laughs> as Foley could tell you. But yes, it, and it, as much as I dearly love that movie, this reference went over the head of everyone in this crowd. Of course. So that failed. Then Jared had the fight Wait, with the... Comedy and TNA failed. Come on, I know, guys. yeah. So then Jared had the fight with the security guards where they beat him up until he fought back and destroyed them two-on-one. And I asked myself, why do these security guards have jobs? Have they ever made anything more secure? They're they're large. you know. And every time they get any physical confrontation, they lose. Sure. Remember Matt Morgan beat him up by himself? Mm -hmm. These security guards suck. Yeah. Fire them. Well, that's why they're security guards and not wrestlers. And Angle did fire him. Or no, who fired him? I don't know. Wait, it was a couple weeks ago. Somebody fired... Oh, Sting did. Sting fired him, remember? That is true. Yeah, okay. Sting had a clue. Then we had an interview with the Blonde and Team 3D. They don't like the British invasion because they literally bit the hand that fed them. I was hoping one of them would run up, bite Devon's hand, and run away. And Raven was shown watching on, and this scared Lauren. As my notes say, Raven is there. The only thing I remember, I, I didn't, there was more stuff that happened, but I don't care. The only thing I remember is that Lauren is standing there interviewing Team 3D, and they keep cutting back and forth from her to Raven, who's sitting on the floor. So she's perfectly fine during this interview, and then as soon as the interview is over, then she gets scared about Raven, who is not moved. <laughs> he's he's He may as well be a corpse. He is not moved. He has not made a, a motion. So by the time the interview is over, now she got scared and ran away. So that was great. Shelly and Lethal against Team 3D. I don't know why it wasn't Shelly and Saban, but I don't really care. So they had a match. It was uh, it was good until the finish when, of course, you had uh, Saban and Creed run into the ring in the middle of this match, which was not a DQ. But then, of course, they had to distract the ref so that when more people ran in, it wouldn't be a DQ. Nothing, of course, everything has to be a clusterfuck in TNA. So anyway, after the match, um, actually during the match, who won, by the way? 
Team 3D oh, lost. Yeah, Team 3D got hit by the Brits, so that yeah. continues that feud. Anyway, uh, all I remember here is they were uh, they were talking about how the X Division is still concerned about who suicide is. I wish I knew why. <laughs> I wish I had a good explanation as to why the X Division gives two fucks who suicide is. Why does it matter? As Tom West said, as long as it's not Glenn Gilberti, I don't really care. <laughs> and that's I, that is that is a quote. Yeah. So anyway, there so you yes, go. Al- Alex Shelley's hair tonight was epic. It was awesome. I, as our friend who watched the show with us described it, it's a whoosh bang. <laughs> he's I, he's leaned down considerably too for some reason. Sure. I don't know but what yes, happened. It, it, the Team 3D worked hard. They worked very well with little guys, especially Devon, and it was a, a fine use uh, uh, of having two great big strong guys work with the little guys, and they were great bases for the guys to jump off of, and they caught them well, and everything was fun. And they did this stupid finish when the British Invasion ran out, and the big dude, whose name I don't remember, I don't care about, he is so ungodly bad. He could not run down the aisle. Well, he's 500 pounds, for Christ's God. sake. Foley is backstage with all of his different security guys, about a million of them, and they all went to throw out Jarrett. And Jarrett said, this doesn't look very single-handed. And so Foley starts talking about how the entire senior citizen community is up in arms about him beating Earl Hebner. Yes, they were playing this whole thing for comedy, for those of you wondering. Yes. And Jarrett finally said, fine, I'm going to walk away voluntarily, but Foley, you need to uh, you need to think about what your real role in TNA is. What is his real role in TNA? He appears to be playing it. Is the champion? The majority shareholder? <laughs> majority shareholder. Who this has segment, the right to make these decisions that Jared doesn't like? This segment fucking sucked. Yeah. It, it was more bad comedy as Jared stood there as Foley and his gang of videos came in. I swear to God, they were just all going, wah, 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 just to make noise. It was even more annoying than when I did it. Then they cut their stupid little promo. That's impossible. It was just, just bad, bad, bad. We had Booker and Joe, or Booker doing a promo about Joe. This is good. And uh, Scott Steiner jumped in as well. Apparently they were going to have a first blood match with Joe and Booker for free on TV in four minutes. And then if Joe won and made Booker bleed, then it was going to be Joe and Steiner. Or no, Joe and Steiner first. And then if if Steiner lost, it was Joe and Booker. Anyway. All all I I know know is Booker and Scott could be fucking awesome promo. They were great. And Steiner's best line was, I'm going to break both of your legs and then make you bleed. Because <laughs> yes. apparently bleeding is worse than breaking both of your legs. Right. And I bled yesterday from my finger, so at least I know if I ever break both legs, it won't be that bad. There you go. So then we had uh, Steiner versus Joe in a first blood match. This was the closest thing on the show to really making me mad. So they have this match, and they're hitting each other with shit. And it's all fine and dandy and that sort of thing. Here's the finish. Steiner gets knocked down outside, and he's leaning against the uh, ring apron. Joe puts a garbage can on his head, on his head and like his shoulders. He then takes a steel pipe, and I'm not joking here. He fucking beat the living shit out of this garbage can, which was on Steiner's head. This looked so brutal. This looked so brutal that this should have been like an injury angle to put a guy out of TNA forever in the main event of a pay-per-view. This is how violent this looked, and just ridiculously violent. So, I mean, you got somebody's got to get a uh, uh, an animated GIF of this and put it on the board, so people that did not see the show can see how fucking ridiculously brutal this looked. So then he takes the can off Steiner's head, and Steiner's fucking just bleeding everywhere. Mm-hmm. So Joe wins. <laughs> Steiner loses even more. So. so I'm pissed off initially just because this is... Scott looks fucking mutilated. They threw this away yeah. in like the first hour of Impact in a five-minute first blood match. So I'm thinking, God, what fucking morons. So then Booker comes out, and to make things worse, Joe beats Booker in about four minutes by hitting him in the stomach with a pipe, and uh, Booker bleeds a little from the mouth, and that's the finish. And it's like, okay, <laughs> you fucking idiots. Can't even have the Booker one go first and the more violent destruction go on second. Is this really that hard? I mean, I, I can see you being fucking goddamn stupid enough to do this Steiner thing for free on TV and just have it be a spot in a match. But for Christ's sake, shouldn't have this gone on after Booker T bleeds a little from the mouth? And then, and then about uh, five minutes later, they cut backstage and all of the mafia is back there. 
and uh, and they're they're tending to these two injured guys. And what's Steiner doing? Why he's sitting on a chair with his head in his hands? Like, wow, that hurt. <laughs> he should have been fucking airlifted to the morgue. He's just sitting on a chair backstage. Should have been on a marble slab in the like, backstage. Wow, yes. can someone get me some ibuprofen for my headache here? So anyway, this just this this came close to pissing me off. There was yeah, there was a lot of stupidity. They kept grabbing weapons, and the weapons were things like trash cans and lead pipes and steel chairs, and they were all blunt objects. And I thought, if there's no rules, and apparently there are no rules, wasn't Joe carrying around a big sword for the past six months? Where did it go? I don't well, know. This, this is a time where it makes sense. So, yes, Scott Steiner, uh, there was also a point where they got close above Joe, and he's he doesn't look as fat as he used to be, but he's still pretty tubby, and he's got the buzzed hair, and for a second there, he looked exactly like Curly from the Three Stooges, which is a bad thing for your angry killer to look like. And then he he badly hurt Scott Steiner, it looks very brutal, he's bleeding everywhere, and then they did the finish with the Booker, and Booker's overselling it for all he's worth, and his lip is quivering, and there's blood spurting out of his mouth, and Don West screams, look at the blood bubbling out of his mouth. And as soon as he said, th in mouth, as soon as the TNH left his mouth, they cut away. Of course. <laughs> it's like, I would like to look at the bubbling out of his mouth, but I can't. There's a commercial on. Of course. We had Douglas and AJ Styles. Shane Douglas versus AJ Styles in 2009. Shane cares so little about this bullshit that he had a farmer's tan. Yes. He was fat. Right. He was wearing a sleeveless T-shirt. That's right. And he had not shaved his armpits. He had pit hair. Grotesque. <laughs> I'm trying to decide which of these was the best. <laughs> Just grotesque. So they had a match, which, you know, normally I bitch about matches being too short, but why the fuck they gave this so much time? <laughs> I have no earthly idea. So AJ won out of nowhere after selling and selling and selling for Shane fucking Douglas. He wins with a flying arm bar out of nowhere. A flying arm bar. Yeah. And a bad one. And then they, uh, then Douglas uh, hit him with a belly-to-belly, and Chris Daniels ran down to make the save. And Douglas cut him off with a towel. <laughs> Turns out there was, there was like, metal in the towel. But still, metal in a towel? <laughs> that be padding? Would that not, yes, would that not be padding around <laughs> well, this metal? My first thought, I knew there was going to be something in the towel, obviously, but I thought it would be a great weight. No. Uh, no. It was like a chain. Handcuffs. So then he handcuffed... Uh, Daniels to the ropes, but uh, Joe made the save. And by the way, later in the show, now maybe I missed something. I'm sure I missed something last week because I missed the whole show, but they cut to Daniels backstage, and he's like, I am challenging you, Shane Douglas, to a match at Slammiversary. Basically a loser leaves town match. If Shane Douglas wins, then Chris Daniels leaves TNA, and if Daniels wins, then Shane Douglas leaves. And I was just sitting there thinking, okay, first off, if this were real, of all the characters in TNA to put their fucking roster spot on the line after all he's been through, Chris fucking Daniels, and second off, Shane Douglas hit you with a loaded towel and handcuffed you to the ropes. Okay, after all the years you've been in TNA, that made you so angry (laughs) you're putting your fucking career on the line? Sure. What is going on in this company? Don't know. So anyway, that was that. I don't know. Shane... Had his, I don't know. It was not a, a great match for sure, but there was one point where Shane Douglas put AJ Styles in a headlock, and uh, AJ's head, head was positioned too low, and so Daniels just let go of the headlock, pulled his chin up, and put it back on. And I thought that was great right there. I'm the only one who thought so, but I thought it was great. We had Lauren freaking out backstage. Raven was stalking her, and she ran into the women's bathroom to escape, and then there was some screaming. And out came Daphne, who had beaten her up. Okay. This was also terrible. <laughs> this was... <laughs> we talk about how sometimes when you're working with uh, young students in the wrestling game, they don't know how to sell because they've never been in a fight, they've never been hit, they've never been hurt before, they don't, they don't know what it's like. Lauren has never been beat up in a bathroom before. No. <laughs> because she, you would hear Daphne scream, and you would hear a loud thud, like a, like a locker had been shoved over and pushed down to the ground. And then you hear Lauren go, oh. <laughs> Don't well, do all the sound effects, I, I, please. I will not, but it was fake and it was phony. And then, the, the, and then after the beating, the camera ran brazenly, went into the women's room, and she was just laying there on the ground. So this sucked. Mm-hmm. There was more. They came back from commercial, and all I can say is it involved Lauren. Let's see. Lauren was out. Daphne was there. 
Taylor Wilde was there, Raven was there, and thankfully, for the first time, thankfully, Dr. Stevie was there. And I say thankfully because I'm still boycotting him. So as long as he's in a segment, I don't have to talk about it. All the people to boycott. It's not him. It's not that I don't like Stevie Richards. It's that I hate the whole Dr. Stevie storyline. Every part of it. We got Borash and the Beautiful People, Power Hour, Comedy, <laughs> and uh, that was that. The only notable thing was they kept calling Tara, which is Victoria's new name, which is all right. But they kept calling her a diva like it was an insult, and that made me giggle. Yeah. Because taking shots at the big company makes you look small. No buys. What the hell has that been all night? <laughs> we had an awesome segment with ODB and Cody Diener. I normally hate ODB segments with a passion, but Cody Diener is so fucking awesome at being Cody Diener that this was money. It went about 30 seconds. I wish it would have gone 30 minutes. They were. He was chasing ducks. He was attempting to weight lift with a stick with cans of paint on each end. They they did some some uh, strong man feats with chains. One of which involved him being pulled face first into her breasts and taking a bump and selling it and selling. This was so awesome. Chasing a duck, screaming, "Come here and make me a man!" <laughs> and then at the end, he went into a pool. Yeah. Well, he he went into a a, a, a muck filled pond. It was so great. It was so awesome. My notes simply read, Diener. <laughs> then we got uh, Angle doing a promo, saying he was going to kill Joe. Yippee. We had uh, Tara and Madison Rain. And by the way, another great TNA moment. Madison is the one person on the roster they build from Seattle, Washington. So, of course, who did not even appear at the fucking TNA house show in Kent? Madison? That's right. And uh, the beautiful people were there, but they didn't bother bringing her. That was great. So anyway, uh, they had this little match, and uh, Victoria is still great. She still looks great. She still wrestles great. She won with the Widow's Peak. And uh, is this is a woman who is going to single fucking handedly turn this entire women's division around. That would be great. That excites me. That would be great. She, she, it. This was actually it was the best match in the show, and it was one of those matches where the crowd, you know, it's the Impact crowd, so it wasn't like they were not into it, but they were they were hitting their spots. They knew when to cheer. They knew when to boo. And then by the end, they were actually going crazy for this wrestling match, and they were so excited to see Victoria win. Or Tara. Yeah. That's going to take some getting used to. Borash interview Young. Name. His interview question consists of, what has gotten into you? And Eric said, nothing. I'm sick of being taken advantage of and abused. And Borash said, listen, as a friend, you need to stop feeling sorry for yourself. So Eric slapped him across the face. The cameraman immediately dropped down to see if Borash was okay. And I just thought... The most concern anyone has ever had for anyone else in TNA, yes. and it's because Jeremy Borash got slapped. Slapped by Eric Young. We just what saw the it. fuck? Lauren was virtually murdered in a locker room 20 minutes ago. And the cameraman just stood there. He waited until the attacker was cleared. Of course. Then after commercial, uh, SoCal Val had taken his place. And this is when Daniels did his wacky promo, which, I don't know. what They write the dumbest shit. You know what I mean? I was that was the, your rhetorical question of the year as I turned 34 here. I was out of the room for this promo, and I I just, I was just surprised because last, last I remember, and I could well be wrong, but SoCal Val was just hanging out with the guru. And yeah. I, I understand he's been turfed, but then she's just backstage doing interviews with no explanation whatsoever. Mm-hmm. I see. Well, I mean, she, she replaced Borash because he got beat up. But my question is... She just hangs around there. <laughs> Just Maybe in storyline, she's a rat. Who fucking knows? That apparently is the answer. I'm trying to put some logic into this. We had uh, Sting and Angle in a Slammiversary qualifier. Or King of the Mountain. I, I don't know. I don't care. They had a pretty fun little match. Sting uh, bleeding bad from the elbow. Uh, for some reason, he started his comeback. Angle hit the rolling Germans. Went for the slam. Sting turned into the Scorpion. A lot of near falls. Finally, Angle goes shoulder first in the post. And out came Matt Morgan. Distracting the referee. And we got a botched spot, but it could not be edited because it was the fucking finish. <laughs> and uh, they stumbled about. Sting bonked into Morgan. Angle hit the slam on Sting for the pin. So Sting apparently is out of Slammiversary or the King of the Mountain. I don't know which. Anyway, <laughs> Angle was pissed off about Morgan afterwards, refused to let him raise his hand. And uh, Angle shoved him. Morgan shoved him back. Geeks hit the ring. Show went off the air. Money. Show's over. Money, you say? <laughs> well, the show's over. That's oh, money. I, I see. Yeah, apparently while we were gone, Samoa Joe, Sting, and Kurt Angle all turned babyface. 
Because based on their actions tonight, they are pretty clear her- heroes, which they were not two weeks ago. I guess so. So that was all very confusing. Sting at one point hit a power bomb. That looked weird. Maybe he hadn't been paying attention to Sting's career, but that seemed like the first move time he'd ever hit that. Move. I think he's hit it before. I yeah, remember. Yeah, I'm sure I'm wrong, but it, yeah. it was strange. But other than that, it was a really a pretty darn good main event. There, it did annoy me. I mentioned uh, in the SmackDown recap that. Edge and uh, Rey Mysterio had a match that went through two, com- two commercial breaks, and that was cool because it was so long. This went through two commercial breaks, but it's not because it was long. They went to commercial, they came back and wrestled for 60 seconds, and they went to another commercial. Lame. But other than that, it was a pretty darn good Impact TV match. And you know on the Impact scale, I'm going to give this show a thumbs up. Nine minutes, 18 seconds, actually, for that main event. So, there was 34 minutes and 40 seconds of wrestling on well, TNA. that was why I liked it more than usual. <laughs> yep, and there was only 12.57 on ECW this week. Really? Although uh, Atlas and Bourne, thank God, was short. Kozlov against the two men, thankfully, was short. And the main event was eight minutes, so... To the back! All right, let's uh, talk about impact here. The show sucks. <laughs> the show was wretched. Okay, just to get out of the way I first... Think- I think I've hit a new, I, can't, I don't know if a new low is the right word, but this show used to make me seriously, legit angry. There's only one segment on this particular show that actually made me mad, because when it was over, and it was the first segment, when it was over, I had to keep reminding myself, Brian, who gives a fuck? Who cares? <laughs> don't let it get to you. It's fucking impact. People like all the time, I, I love reading people going, is it the same impact rant again? Like, it's our fault. Yeah. Let's look at this show. Foley came out with Earl Hebner, two fat security guards, and a clown. A clown. That's not a metaphor, for everyone. He came out with a, a shoot clown. A was TNA world champion. Confetti and party bullshit all over the ring. And Earl Hebner, of course, apparently got beat up on a show we didn't watch because we were at a house show. So they've got something stuffed in his mouth so his cheek looks all swollen. But they still made him put in his referee's earpiece. For some reason, that just I love that detail. It was so stupid and pointless. So, Foley says, I found my smile again after just a week. It's time to call out some special guests. So he calls out AJ Styles, Samoa Joe, and Kurt Angle. So, Joe, who the last I heard had vowed to kill Kurt Angle. Put Kurt Angle in the grave. He is in the ring with not only Kurt Angle, but a clown. Mm -hmm. A fucking clown. Yes. Samoa Joe, quite frankly, just standing next to the clown in this ring immediately killed him forever. Just by being near this clown. So then Foley says, we're all here tonight to welcome back a special man. We're We're welcoming him back home, Jeff Jarrett. Jeff has been gone a half a show. Yes, he was suspended last week in the middle of the show. It, and he did not leave until near the end of the show. Yeah. So his one-week suspension has ended, and Foley is throwing a party that involves a clown and Samoa Joe. And by the way, I swear to God this is true. So he comes out, and uh, they shot confetti all over. Foley signs A.J. Joe against Angle Sting against Jared and Foley for the main event. He asks everybody to shake hands. Kurt Angle actually obliges. Sure. Foley's like, everyone put their hand out, put your hand on top of each other, and let's all say peace, love, and understanding. And he puts his hand out, and A.J. puts his hand on top, and Kurt Angle puts his hand on top. And then Joe goes to put his hand on top. And it became a brawl, and I swear to God, the moment this brawl began, it was to the back. Yeah. I mean, not even, not even, did not skip a beat. We, we were left with uh, about a dozen people in the ring, still fighting, and immediately to the back. It was, yeah. It was, it was a segment in which everyone except Foley, and this is the way they wanted it, by the way, everyone except Foley was embarrassed to be there. But they were still there. But they were still going through with it. But they were still going through with it. This segment Samoa, was so horrible. So, Kurt Angle, he came out and he... he, 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 he there was tension between him and Joe, obviously. Oh. But uh, he still got in the ring. Joe still uh, stood there and they, they, they were in the ring, in, in the ring together not doing anything for a few minutes. And then Kurt Angle wanted to do the wacky handshake with these men 
who are going to be fighting for the world title in like three days. Yeah. Yeah. So why are we still talking about this segment? Does this Kurt let Joe walk up to him and punch him in the face because he thought Joe would go through the handshake? Yeah. Kurt's dumb. Let's move on. The whole thing is fucking stupid. You're right. Let's move on. We had... Oh, oh, by the way, to the back. (laughs) What did we go to the back for? Raven, Stevie, and Daphne. Yes. I took no notes. (laughs) I ignored that this segment existed. I only know that Raven was talking about how he can sense abyss, he can sm- sm- sense abyss, he can smell abyss, and he said he can taste abyss. Hmm. Gay. Chris Daniels against Red. This actually almost made me mad because it was like, why can't the whole show just be stuff like this? This was like a great, as great as a three-minute match as you're going to get. Match ruled for three minutes is what my notes say. They uh, they did, Red did a, a tornado dive to the outside, which Don explained. He does, he kind of does all these rotations. He kind of does all these rotations. Thank you. Can you dumb that down for me a bit? So this was one of those fun matches where Daniels, he's usually like the smaller guy in the ring, but here he got to play a far more mobile version of the big show. In a way, sure. It was great. He was great. He's phenomenal. And the, the finish where... I guess it wasn't even the finish, but there was a, a point where he caught Red in a fireman's carry and had the smoothest Death Valley driver I've ever seen. Yeah. He's golden. Actually, the best of the big show part was Red making his comeback with all these drop kicks, and Chris Daniels is staggering, like he's trying to keep his balance from yeah, taking yeah. a bump, like a giant. <laughs> he's doing the giant Like spot. the great Kali. Yes. So... And so for, that's the only time in history you'll ever see me compare Chris Daniels to the great Kali, by the way. So enjoy it. Well, they both worked in California. And after it was over, uh, he won, by the way. And uh, Douglas appeared on the screen and actually cut a pretty good promo hyping up a match nobody could possibly care about. <laughs> an absurd match that no one cared about, but uh, his, his delivery was fine. He set up for this suck so bad. It was prefaced by a promo. I think it was, I think it was from the show we miss. But Douglas was saying... Or, yeah, Douglas was saying, Daniels, they gave you a second chance. Where's my second chance? That was two weeks ago. Last week, he wrestled. Yeah. So apparently, he's gotten his second chance. What's yeah. he so angry about now? I don't know. I don't know. We had a skit with Lauren, Taylor, Kong, and Raisha. The only thing I noted here was Kong spoke. Why would Kong... Kong, everybody. Why would Kong speak? Apparently they saw MAGA cut a promo on SmackDown two months ago and thought it was cool. No buys. And t- before that, Taylor and Lauren acted horrible. Hyped up the X Division match at the pay per from Lauren to come, but yes. Uh, I was wondering why we have two King of the Mountain matches on the pay-per-view, particularly since one of them involves the X Division, which is going to go on first and is inevitably going to be better. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was thinking about this. Even if they gave the X Division guys five minutes to have a King of the Mountain match, it would still be better than the main event one. Right. So why would you put this on the pay-per-view to expose how shitty your main eventers are in the same match? Because they're retarded. Okay. I accept that. Then we had the Matt Morgan promo with Sting. Called out Sting and basically ran him down under the guise of not running him down and asked him for a... Actually, I don't know. This was confusing. He, he was essentially asking for a title match because he said, um, I, I asked to be in the Mafia, and you said I couldn't because I was never a champion, but how was I ever supposed to be a champion if I never even got a shot? He said this, yes. And somehow this led to Sting going, I will give you a match at Slammiversary, and if you win, you take over the Mafia. Yeah. <laughs> what? It, it, it could have been worded better. I got what they were trying to do. Morgan had like one sentence, and it should have been beaten into our heads. But he said something like, "I may not be a world, I may not be a world champion, but if I beat you, then I will have beaten a world champion." Mm. And I guess that's good enough. So they have a, that. That if they leave it there, it's a perfectly fine segment. The 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 heel is a challenge. He has a valid point. Where if I beat you, that will prove I'm good enough to be in your group. Sting accepts, and he says, "Okay, that's fine." Then Sting, for no reason. Puts the leadership of the Mafia on the line. Of course. Morgan says, cool. And then to finish it off, Morgan charges, Sting sidesteps. Morgan goes flying over the top rope like, I wrote down a geek. I wrote a fool. And uh, somewhere here, I, I think tool may have been the best word. <laughs> Regardless, it's not what you want the, the, the young upstart to look like as he's challenging the Hall of Famer. So, way to go, TNA. Brush interviewed Jarrett. 
He had one of those cars where he rattled off all the latest storylines. I got bored. Anyway. <laughs> I, wrote, I, I wrote down Jarrett skit with Borash, and I have no memory of it. My effort for this show now warrants it's what it deserves, frankly. Jeff did say the only reason he didn't get rid of Foley was because you had to have compassion for a guy like that. What kind of a reason is that? <laughs> you know what made me so one. mad about that stupid reason is... Can they say something that makes sense? Like, I can't get rid of the guy because he's the majority shareholder. No. No, no he can't get rid of him because you have to have compassion for a guy like that. Yes. I could have sworn he hated Foley and vowed to get rid of him. I now he has compassion for him? I do remember he was talking about how he didn't know what Foley was going to do. He wouldn't know, didn't know if he was going to be his partner tonight or if he would turn on him. And he didn't seem to care. He didn't seem to care that this man just made, made me attack him. I just so, yawned. Let's move on. Because now we have to talk about Raven versus Jethro Holiday. This is another one of those matches where it's just a shitty three-minute match involving Jethro Holiday that makes you never want to see the aforementioned match ever again. They had two sides of steel there. There were weapons. <laughs> okay, for, before we get into this, no, as they're making the entrance, coming out of the last segment with Jeremy and Jarrett, Mike Tanay said, this is a direct quote, I've got to admit, I've given up. <laughs> <laughs> here, 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 here. This was horrible in every conceivable yes, way. And, uh, uh, they looked horrible physically. Yes. They had a horrible wrestling match. Right. There it, was no point to it. There was no point to it. Lead anything. It and, was short. It did not make you want to see anything. And and they're having this match with two sides of steel and weapons hanging down from it. And at one point, Steve, Doctor Stevie hits Jethro Holiday with a cane, and the announcers say, "Oh, cheap shot." Yeah. Because God forbid someone breaks the rules in this match. <laughs> Raven won with a DDT. Oh, God. Daphne brought out a straight jacket, but then Abyss made the save. Don West interviewed Joe. Now, I didn't rewind because I do not care enough. But I could have sworn that the interview started with Don saying, it's very clear you're listening to somebody. And then Joe said, I listen to no man. And then Don, and I know Don said this, Don said, well, clearly you're being advised by someone. And Joe said, yes, I actually am. <laughs> How are you advised by someone who you don't listen to? Well, maybe maybe he's tweeting. Huh. Maybe Taz is sending tweets to Joe. So, Can you do that texting Joe? I don't know, I'm old. Anyway, uh, they, yeah, anyway, I don't know what happened here. All I know is they're playing the best dramatic music during this video. Oh, that's right. Joe said this. It, 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 it's the kind of thing, well, first of all, this is clearly not live, so it was not that dumb, but it was so hokey and corny. It was like, the, the, the I don't know, the dramatic reveal of the villain in a fantasy film, but it was awesome, awesome music. Joe said we'd meet his whatever soon enough. Can't wait. Then we had Lauren and Abyss backstage. You know what's funny is, is uh, I know people are going to find this impossible to believe, but I actually think Abyss is like an underrated promo. I think that's funny. And no, come on now. Remember, remember, like two months ago that he did that promo for the pay per view match. It was like a fucking great promo for a match that nobody could still possibly care about. I do vaguely recall that, but I, I, I am thinking about the promo here tonight. You thought it was good, and well, well it was at, at a point. It I, was. It see, was, I didn't think so. The, as soon as he started doing his stupid, fake, crazy giggle, I thought, who would possibly want to watch this? I I thought that he did a pretty damn good promo that unfortunately fell off a cliff as soon as he brought Lauren into it. And the whole thing was, he, he was talking about how horrified he was that they had laid their hands on her. And by the way, I watched last week's show, and I don't remember this. But anyway... You, you a, were in the bathroom in that part. I see. She had a bandage on her arm, and uh, he took it off to reveal a bruise. Her arm was bruised. First of all... <laughs> now, as stupid as it is that this grave injury that has caused him to lose his mind is a bruise, but worst off... When he reveals his bruise, this causes her to begin crying. Shame. She begins weeping profusely. <laughs> There's a purple mark just above her elbow. This is cause for woe. She runs off crying. He goes nuts about how his mom always told him not to hit girls. But Daphne was no girl. Yeah. She was a whacked out crazy bitch. And, uh, I should make it clear, it's still illegal to hit those. Well, they in the next no in the next match, which was Angelina Daphne against uh, Taylor and Kong, uh, Don West was pointing out that, and this was how he was plugging the pay per view. Yes, he basically said, 
you can't see men hitting women on TV for free. But if you pay for the pay-per-view, mm-hmm. shit's on. He's not making this up. No. This is what they're advertising. You'll get to see Abyss beat up Daphne if you buy the pay-per-view. This is when I came up also with a number of, of gimmicks for you, including uh, Abysmal Kong and uh, what is actually now, I wish I'd thought of this before Abysmal Kong, but Opossum Kong. Yeah. Awesome. The uh, Actually, the, the first one was Adequate Kong. <laughs> that's right, Adequate Kong. I, I knew you'd find something more negative. So it was well, I, that's what I pointed out to you. It was like, how can you not like that when it's, it's somewhat of a compliment? You are you are adequate. I still like Onion Blossom Kong. No. Mm. Opossum Kong is much better. Unfortunately, I confused an opossum with a raccoon. Well, yeah, because I wanted breaks. to just paint black circles around your eyes. And call but, it good. But then I thought of the idea of... You're a possum Kong, and every time you start coming down to the ring, someone in a golf cart zooms out and hits you, and you never make it to the ring. And I die. Well, you just never make it to the ring. It's ongoing comedy. And it saves us from having to see you wrestle. Mm. And it saves me from having to wrestle. Exactly. So it's but you do have to get hit by a golf cart every week. I would rather get hit by a golf cart than wrestling. Not if I'm driving. That's true. We had, uh, oh, oh. So, yeah. the, so the match was? The match was uh, Kong and Taylor against Angelina and Daphne. And the pay-per-view match is apparently uh, Angelina versus uh, Tara, who is not in this match. So what was the finish? Well, after spending half the show plugging this uh, mixed tag Monsters Ball match at the pay-per-view involving Daphne, Awesome Kong pins Daphne. (laughs) Why? (laughs) Well, because they're retarded. For absolutely no good reason. Yes, the, 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 the three women in this match... Excuse me, there are four women in this match. Three of them are on the pay-per-view. The other one got the pin. That's how it went down. Yeah, it started off with high comedy because each of the heels was afraid of the woman that they've been feuding with. Angelina was, af- Angelina was afraid of Awesome Kong. Fine. Daphne was afraid of Taylor Wilde. That's fine, except she was not afraid of Awesome Kong. Of course not. She would rather wrestle Awesome Kong than Taylor Wilde. Yeah. So... Yeah, they, they went for like two minutes. It was dumb. Raisha got involved. There was hairspray. I don't know. I didn't write it down. Then Awesome Kong pinned Daphne, which was the peak of stupidity. Then as she got to her feet, Velvet Sky ran into the ring, hit Awesome Kong with a forearm to the back, and laid her out. Yeah. <laughs> By herself. Velvet Sky <laughs> dropped Awesome Kong with one blow. You sure. So they're working her over. Out comes Tara to make the save. And that's when it hit me. Wait a minute. Awesome Kong's not on the pay-per-view. Jesus Christ! So awesome. Or Tara clears the ring, and she and Kong had a moment together, and then they left. Team 3D did a promo ranting about beer money in the British invasion, and I didn't care. Then we had more with ODB and Cody Deaner. Fuck yeah! Remember when ODB segments were like the worst thing by far in the history of the show? Yes. Now they are awesome. No. All Cody Deaner's of, segments are awesome. No, still with ODB. ODB happens to be there. No, ODB is an integral part of this because they are a great comedy duo. Would this really work with Cody Deaner and... Yes. I, I was going to say Tara, but I'm thinking now Taylor Wilde. Taylor Wilde You would, really think Taylor Wilde and Cody Deaner would be half as funny I, as Cody Deaner and ODB? Tara would actually be a vast improvement. If you recall, she did a lot of great comedy, particularly the banana costume on SmackDown. No, but I I think that Cody I Deaner... I can see that ODB was, is much better for this role than Taylor Wilde. She was uh, she is great uh, in this segment. Uh, Cody Deaner is ten times greater, don't get me Cody wrong. Cody Deaner is the best man on earth. But uh, the, the whole gimmick is she's training him to wrestle, which in itself is ironic since he's wrestled a bunch of times before he started training him, but... She's training him to wrestle, and he's improving. Yes. And he managed to catch a duck at the end of the segment, and right. he's now ready. He caught a duck and said, look, I caught a duck. And then it cracked, and he went, ah, and he let it go. But there was clips of him running. There was clips of him doing taking a body slam on grass. There was clips of him saying, every wrestler needs a finisher, as he is standing on what appears to be a high thing, and then he falls about three feet onto a big mattress. There was clips of him. They, they strung up ropes between two trees, and he ran into them and tumbled over. Yes. He's the coolest guy in the world. He was awesome. Just awesome. Yes. Nothing but positive things to say about this segment. Jay Lethal, Consequences Creed, Motor City Machine Guns, and SoCal Val are doing a promo backstage. It was fucking horrendous okay. until all of a sudden, it just became supremely awesome when, out of nowhere, Lethal screams, You're a harlot! Yes. Well, see, it made me... While it was horrible, 
Well, the deal was, Lethal wouldn't shut up talking smack about Val, because as you recall, the last time they were together, she broke his heart and let and left him for the guru. So, the nine times out of ten in the show, things people are just friends again for no reason. Here, there was continuity. That never happens. They all hate each other for no reason. I, I stand corrected. Regardless, there was continuity here. Jay Lethal remembered, this is the woman that broke my heart, and he wouldn't let anyone forget, and he told the machine Harlot. guns... She, he, before he called her Harlot, he told the machine guns, don't, don't get too close to her, you'll think she loves you, and then she'll sleep with your best friend. And then she starts to interview the guns, and Shelly says something about how, so you're telling me if I stand next to this woman, she'll sleep with Chris Saban? And Saban was down with this. <laughs> Saban thought this was a fine plan. So, yes, and, and, then, and then he called her a Harlot. It was grand. Things got wacky. I don't know. I laughed. I, I, I don't know if it's good or bad, but it did make me laugh. The harlot line was the best. And by the way, why is SoCal Val still doing interviews? She started doing them last week because Borash got beaten up and she replaced him. And now this week, Borash is totally fine. So why is she still here? Don't know. All right. We had uh, Beer Money and Team 3D getting into a brawl, which led to Beer Money and Team 3D against Creed and Lethal and the Machine Guns, which went 10 seconds when they pinned Shelly with a 3D. Yeah. So, Team 3D fought off their partners. Suicide came out and did something, but basically, Team 3D fought off their partners and then killed three men. Yeah. He killed the entire X Division match here in 10 seconds. Way to go. Yeah, way to go. So, Foley hired a new head of security backstage. I have no idea who this was. I do. Who was it? It was Davis. All I know is that when this guy walked in, Foley's like, I loved watching you as a kid. Yes. Did I miss something? I have no idea who this guy was. They identified him as Davis. <laughs> okay. So then we have Kip James coming in as a handyman around the impact zone. And uh, this segment, <laughs> I swear to God, was five times as long as the match I just witnessed <laughs> with Team 3D killing it the X Division. kept going. And, and yeah, <laughs> it was following the issue of phone call saying, I have someone to hang this up. And we brought us out a cartoon he wanted to hang up. It was very dumb. Then Kip came in, and he's very methodically hanging this up. He pulls out a tape measure. He checks the corners against the wall. They talk about using a level. Kip says, no, this will work. It went on forever. And meanwhile, yes, we saw Team 3D pin three guys in seconds. The the show. This show. And we had Sting and Angle against Joe and AJ against Foley and Jarrett. Foley actually looks like he's lost a shitload of weight. I will say that. And uh, he went to do commentary, though, because he got tired. And, of course, they did the spot where Jarrett was crawling to the corner, but Foley was still at the booth. And uh, he was too slow to get back to save his supposed pal. And other guys, meanwhile, were noting that Jarrett could just have tagged anybody. Yes. <laughs> but, of course, he has to go to the empty corner like a moron. Joe and AJ were just standing there with their arms held out. So he finally tags Joe, runs wild. And then Jarrett went after Foley at the booth and hit him with a chair shot. And then Joe gave Angle a muscle buster. Actually, he gave Joe uh, he gave uh, Angle a power bomb onto Sting's back I as Sting was laying face down. This, yeah, this looks like it. Sucked. Gotta be kidding me. For both guys, they, they, I have no idea what the point of this was. It's 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 like the urinagi and the apron spot where I have no idea who thought of it or what the point was. But this looks like it killed both of them to a very bad degree for absolutely nothing. It will never be seen again. No. It accomplished nothing. It no. just caused them pain. And then Joe pinned Angle with the muscle buster, and uh, that was the end. The usual, out of TNA, I don't care. That's your review. To the back! What the hell was his name? Slammiversary. Slammiversary. Which I know, because I wrote it down. Slammiversary, yeah. So, uh, well, let's get into it, Vince. What are we doing first? I don't give a fuck. I'm not, I've already reviewed Slammiversary and Ultimate Fighter, so the show is going to be in your hands. Right. And I'm going to have to constantly interrupt you to bring life back to it. Uh, good, good, good idea. Yes. Well, I have some anniversary in my hands here, so we'll start with that. So this is the show that I had to go back to my car to get my notes for, and uh, <laughs> that happened during the edited portion of this yeah, program, yeah. by the way. Um, and I was looking at this, uh, my other notes before going over the show, and then these notes. I'm looking at them here, and my notes are becoming less and less useful. <laughs> I'm putting less energy into them. So if I if I get anything terribly vague, I will share it with you verbatim. But otherwise, we'll just take it as it goes. We basically just need the the you know yeah. The basics. The uh, the pre-show match had Eric Young and Rhino against the British Invasion. Eric Young bailed. He decided he didn't want to wrestle on the show, or he wanted to be in a pay-per-view, or some bullshit. No one cared. Uh, this left Rhino as the Detroit hometown hero to get beaten up by both Brits, and he was 
saved by Jesse Neal, who has a, a spectacularly bad haircut. I applaud him on this do, I guess you'd say. Yeah, and especially since his gimmick is he's a Navy guy. That, that kind of kills the gimmick, yes, but at least he, at least he does not look generic. He looks wacky. So he ran down and he demanded to be made a partner and, and Don West protested this, protested this should be illegal. He said he didn't want any of this Memphis stuff in there. Uh, the ref let him be the partner. He tagged in. He was running wild. Looked all right. Crowd was going crazy. Then they pinned him. He yeah. hit with a move and he got pinned. All right. TNA, everyone. He killed him. So with that, that was our encouragement to buy the pay-per-view. So the show opened, they had a wide shot of the arena. It was the Palace of Auburn Hills. There were plenty of good seats still available. There's this, this wide shot made it abundantly clear how empty the place was. Opener was Suicide, Alex Shelley, Chris Saban, Jay Lethal, and Consequences created in the five-way King of the Mountain X Division match. They had Curtis Grandison there from the Detroit Tigers to hold the belt, and he also did commentary, and he was enthusiastic, he was knowledgeable, and he was well-spoken, so Curtis Grandison on commentary was a, was a win. That worked out great for everyone. Uh, the usual wacky, uh, insanity, uh, crazy collection of spots. There was a bit where three guys went for a pin, and the ref counted the pin, and it was not sure who should be legal, so the referee was confused by the rules. Then there was a bit where uh, the machine guns went to climb the uh, ladder, and the ref had to tell them, wait, no, you're not eligible yet. So they were confused by the rules. And then it almost became worth it because the machine guns were working together. So they knew you had to pin someone, or they figured out that you had to pin someone to be eligible. So they just pinned each other. Saban laid down. Shelly pinned him. Saban then complained of, a, complained of a tights pull, which was awesome. Then he went to the cage while Shelly tried to win. So that was good. This is wrestlers being smart, which is always nice. There was a lot of insane stuff. Uh, the, uh, what's his name? Uh, Jay Lethal was perched on a ladder on the top rope when the ladder thing got catapulted and sent Jay going through the sky and he almost died. That was very scary. Cool idea, kind of stupid in execution. Uh, there was a Sabu chair spot. It was, they did a, the Sabu chair spot, I believe it was Shelly, but he pointed to the sky like Sabu first just to let everyone know he was ripping it off. And then earlier, the two tag teams, which were Creed and Lethal and the Machine Guns, they worked together. Then they all got together for a big four man Los Guerreros huddle. That was awesome. So, Good tribute to other wrestlers there. If you're going to steal their stuff, I guess you may as well acknowledge it. They did a uh, Saban and I believe it was Lethal or Creed, but one of them did a a big flying elbow onto a ladder bridge. The ladder did not break. It looked like both guys died. That sucked. That sucked. Consequences, Creed, Creed did a big flip dive. Whoever was supposed to catch him didn't. He landed. That leg sucked. He basically rolled up to, his, to, a, seat, to a seated position and s- screamed, Oh, my God. Probably hated life. And uh, after all this, eventually, let's see, I did, I did not write down the winner. Suicide won, didn't he? I seem to recall Suicide winning. He won. He won, yes. So he, he uh, took care of his opposition. He, he climbed the ladder. He won. He hung the belt. He won. Which I, the Suicide character still seems to be fresh. It's way too early to unmask him or anything. So at least he still won. That's good. So a very fun opener. I believe you gave us three and a half stars, somewhere in that vicinity. Yes, that I did. Seems perfectly reasonable to me. We had a Shane Douglas promo. It was a his promos in the week or two he's been back have been very good. This is another very good one. He basically said that he would win. Only he's a better promo than me, so it's more exciting. Sadly, he then had to wrestle, and uh, he got hurt here. So I do feel bad about noting how funny it was when he was running. But now I know it's not just that he was fat and clumsy. He was actually injured. That being said, there was a point here where he was where Daniels was making his comeback, and Douglas couldn't get up to his feet. And it's not that he could not stand on his injured ankle is that he was laying on his back and not even bothering to sit up. So that looks very bad, but what can you do? Daniel said the best moonsault ever and won. It was a bad match, but it was nothing horrible in the long run, I guess. There's worse things in this life to, to, to be concerned with. There's an interview with Mick Foley. He thought Jeff Jarrett was going to be on his side for Christ knows what reason. I guess he threw a party for him on the impact. It was stupid. He uh, said he would defend the title tonight, and then again 16 months later, and then he was sang, sang and dance, and Foley is a clown. Yeah, as a, as a champion, by the way. Yeah, as the and not even not even the the secondary title. Like the Honky Tonk Man was the Intercontinental Champion. Mick Foley is the TNA Champion, the folks of the company, and he's a goof. So that's stupid. Okay, here's a point where my notes fail me. The match was Tara, formerly known as Victoria, against Angelina Love. I will read this in its entirety. No heat for heat. 
then love wins after hairspray. What more is there to say? That's all I was moved to write. <laughs> what more is there to say? The <laughs> match was three minutes long. Apparently nothing. So that's all I had to say about that. Then my notes read Raven promo. Fortunately, I recall this because Raven went absolutely insane. <laughs> this was the best thing on the whole show. <laughs> it probably was. In nine, well, no, the opener was good, but this is the funniest thing on the whole show. He he got his promo, and, and like Shane Douglas, he's been cutting good promos since he came back, and he's cutting this good promo about how he and Abyss are, uh, there's there's no hope for them. They're hopelessly addicted to pain, but there's one chance for redemption, and, and he's spitting all this bullshit. And then he does his quote the Raven never more than he strikes his pose, and then he starts to cackle. And cackle and cackle, then he hugs Dr. Stevie, and then he weeps for a bit. And it just kept going, was the best part. They just left the camera on him as he emoted for a while. So that was good. Then we had the match. It was Raven and Daphne versus Abyss and Taylor Wilde in a Monsters Ball match, which I basically it means you can just do whatever the hell you want. You recall... <laughs> Actually, wait, before I, I need to know here. As they were doing the entrances, Taylor Wilde came out... And her music's this perky song, and she came out with this violent death match. And she came out, and her song's playing, and she does her wacky little pose, and she's got her new gear on, which is like a swimsuit. She looks all happy, and it's very upbeat thing. And then she, like, tried to change moods, tried to get serious for the, the war she was about to enter. So that failed. So you recall they are building on Impact. We can't show you men beating up women here on Impact, because Spike won't allow it. But if you buy the pay-per-view, you'll get to see guys beat up chicks. So that was the hook of this whole this whole match, was man and woman violence. So uh, Abyss squashed Daphne about a minute in. <laughs> he threw her into the turnbuckle. He hit a big avalanche. He whomped her. There was your payoff. They did a whole lot of brawling. They, they did some really stupid spots. Da- outside the ring, Daphne jumped on Abyss's back, and he threw her to the ground. Her head almost hit the stairs. It, it terrified me. They brawled through the crowd for a lot. Don was complaining because he couldn't see all that was going on. Uh, they, the girls set up a table by the stage. Then he went through it. And uh, to their credit, they, they, they then both of them crawled back on their hands and knees. It took them like three minutes after this table spot. So they did not just get up and run back to the ring. So that was good. Then they were doing all this, all these stupid stuff. Abyss got the tax. Then Stevie got a chair. Somebody got Kane to the head. Uh, Daphne ended up going into the tax pretty damn soon, really. They were not out there for long, and she needed a spine buster from Taylor. And uh, it I, I don't know what they were trying to do. I think she was supposed to run away from Abyss, but in a Taylor or something. But she was trying not to step in the tax. In the process of doing this, she stepped right in them and then take the move in the tax. So that had to suck, and uh, it was not terribly fun to watch. And then Taylor made, had to cover her in the tax. And, oh, they did a bunch of other stuff. There was a cane. There was a trash can. There was a chair. And after all of this... Raven ended up taking a black hole slam into the tax for the pin. Finish looked really cool. It was a garbage match. If you like garbage matches, you probably like this one. And uh, that's really all I have to say about that. We have a Jarrett promo. He stated clearly and plainly that he did not want to win the World Heavyweight Championship. Great. That's, that tells me I should not care about this either. But he said it was very important that he... Very important that he that, that Foley not be champion, because then Jarrett would have control. Wouldn't Foley still be the majority majority shareholder of the company? Let's not analyze these storylines. All right. I just want to explain to me why the champion of TNA has power. Or Vince, stroke, this has control. never been explained. This is the storyline forever. I still want to know. <laughs> You'll never get an answer, because they don't have one. Yeah. We had Matt Morgan versus Sting. Everything was going along just fine. Until there was just some major league boshery. I blame Morgan. Others, I, I guess I blame Sting. Maybe if I watch it again, I would change my mind. Regardless, it sucked. It was supposed to be a suplex reversed in the Scorpion Death Drop, and it did not work. They both fell down. So then Sting tried to do the Death Drop again, and Morgan still couldn't take it. That's why I blame him for the fuck-up before. And then finally, uh, Sting hit a Scorpion Death Drop off the second rope for the win. Not good. It was fine up until that one point, and then just fell apart, and there was no no recovery from there. But, again, there are worse things in life to worry about. So, we had AJ and Joe cutting a promo together. AJ uh, vowed that it was time for the originals, which Joe's not one of. It was about time for the originals to take over again. Even Jeff Jarrett wouldn't be in their way, even though, as the founder, I guess, he wouldn't he be the ultimate original? I guess not. So, uh, Joe said that, yeah, he had AJ's back. Which is is Kearney for I'm going to screw you in the main event. 
three D versus beer money, a good match that I basically just felt like I had seen about sixteen times now. Um, that's really all I have to say about the match itself. Uh, the British Invasion came out to interfere for no good reason. Bubba Ray Dudley hit a plancha off the top rope to the floor onto this man. I cannot believe this. It actually happened. This was the ultimate flying fat guy move. Uh, Doug Williams got put through a table at some point, and then finally Beer Money hit their move and won. And and here's a point. That my, my notes close with something that pretty much sums up my feelings. Too much stuff going on for something I don't care about. Kurt Angle cut a promo. He has grown out of stubble and uh, grown a short beard. My first thought was, wow, he looked awful. Then I realized he had at least, like, he. Had, it was not, it looked like he had just not showered or shaved in a week. And on, on closer inspection, he's, like, shaved the top of the beard on his cheeks and he shaved his neck. So he's just grown it out. And uh, I'm going to give it a chance. You know, it was not a, it was not a flattering look in the newsletter. You said I thought it was it was different. If uh, I will give it a month, and if it still looks ugly in a month, then I'll say so. But right now, it's just different. So they had the match. It was Jarrett versus Kurt Angle versus Mick Foley versus AJ Styles versus Samoa Joe, and the really really stupid King of the Mountain match. I'm going to skip straight to the finish here. The finish was Joe turning on everyone and helping Kurt Angle win. And uh, then the Mafia came out, Nash and Steiner and Booker and Charmel, and they all applauded. So I guess Samoa Joe is in the Mafia now. He is a former world champion, so he may- it makes sense that way at least. But as you recall, he spent the mas- last month trying to kill these men. He put a trash can on Scott Steiner's head and hit it with a stick so badly that Brian and I were screaming. And he hit Booker T in the, in the belly with a stick, and he made Booker T bleed. And then he spent all this match beating the hell out of Kurt Angle, including giving him a suplex onto a ladder. And apparently this is all part of their plan. It's all part of the plan to serve people. And it begs the question, if you have Samoa Joe on your side anyway, why don't you just fight together throughout the entire match? Why would you do a swerve? Don't know. I don't know either. So, yeah. And, and <laughs> Jeff... Jeff, meanwhile, whose mission to was a he stated his mission was to get Mick Foley the title off Mick Foley. So why, when for example AJ Styles would climb the ladder, why would Jeff pull him off? Shouldn't he have been pushing the AJ up there to get the, the whole title thing off was Mick stupid. Foley? It makes no sense. Yeah. So that was a waste of my life. To the back. All right. Um, Impact, as noted, was uh, one of the best impacts of the year, and. God, my tongue is killing me. Should I go for a while? Go for a while here. Show opened, opened, I say, with Brother Ray Dudley versus Brutus Magnus in a New York City street fight. We've been over this before, but the whole point of stipulation matches is to draw pay-per-view buys or to draw viewers to your show. You can't do that if you don't have any build at all whatsoever for them. And certainly not if you open the show with them. So it accomplished nothing. They had a brawl. They brought through the crowd. The crowd loved this match. It was very over. And basically, Brother Ray killed him forever until about four men run, ran in. Uh, Devon tried to say it, but he was overwhelmed. And then finally they fought back. Kiyoshi went through a table. And Buddhist Magnus retreated. And so we were informed the match was a no contest. Of course. And so I ask again, what was the point of the street fight? It established nothing. It accomplished nothing. It wasted all of our time. Blonde tried to get info on Angle and Joe. This pissed me off. Well. They, they do this all the time. They do a non-promo where they go to interview someone who doesn't want to talk. Why put it on TV? I was just looking what at this. What does it accomplish? Well, supposedly it's live, but I was just looking at this like, if this were real, wouldn't Lauren have been fired like years back? For not getting no interviews? No one ever talks to her. And if they do, they call her a bitch. Sure, sure. So they didn't talk to her. Can't they get, like, a mean man to interview people? Like Scott Steiner? <laughs> no one's going to ignore Scott Steiner, that and no one's going to so call him a bitch. awesome. Can you imagine this question Scott Steiner would ask? <laughs> I'm fucking telling you, you I could book this shit better than Russo. Yes. So they didn't want to talk to Lauren. It was all a big secret. And then after commercial, they came out of the ring to talk anyway. That yep. annoyed me further. Angle did a promo, said he was new champion. Called out Joe, who hugged everybody. Jenna and Charmel were still there, by the way, despite being fired. And Angle explained that Jenna had invested her millions into the mafia, and that was enough to hire Joe. 
So the obvious question is, is she fucking him? Because if not, what is she getting out of this investment? Uh, that her friends no longer have to fight Joe. That's this is worth millions of dollars. That's the best answer I have for you. Is that serious? Okay, there's a guy in my jujitsu class named Thad who beats the shit out of everybody. Mm-hmm. I ain't paying a million dollars for him to be my friend and not beat up on me. That is a bad investment. Well, you did not win money on Survivor. Jesus. Maybe if you did, you would see the logic in this. So, anyway, um, they didn't tell, tell Sting, and he said he hoped Sting forgave him. Foley came out. He is now a babyface again, of course. Kinda. Well, who knows what he is. He said he had a rematch clause. He was a babyface for this segment, for sure. He wanted it one-on-one. Angle told him no, because Christ knows Angle knows he can't get a good match out of Mick Foley in a singles match. That's Foley's gimmick. He gets tired fast. How are you gonna How are you going to hide this in a fucking singles match with Kurt Angle? So then Angle cut his usual nonsensical TNA promo about how Foley did not have any power anymore, you know, because he's not the champion. Apparently, being the fucking majority shareholder of the company does not have any power associated with it. And then he said, let's go back and talk. You do us a favor, I'll give you your title shot. So apparently, Foley does have power. I don't know what the fuck is going on. I don't... I. The content left a lot to be desired is true. The delivery of both of these men was fantastic. As Angle was ranting about how... Uh, First, he was ranting about how Foley had no power, which he later turned out he did, but his, he was, it was a great rant. Then Foley did his rant about how he wanted a title shot, and then Angle acted outraged that Foley thought he could beat him, and they went back and forth, and the delivery was tremendous. If you didn't actually pay attention to the words they were saying, this was good. Couldn't they just say the words, I know I can beat you, no you can't, you fat fuck, all right, let's have a match? Apparently that's never possible in this company. They must, they, they, must, they must be more intelligent than that, I guess. You know when Scott Steiner calls Bubba Ray a fat a fat ass, I want to see him fight. <laughs> I mean, it's just me. I actually want to see him go in there and pound that fat ass. Announcers talked to Jared on the phone, said it was time for the two of them to rise above him and Foley, and if he had to step up, he'd do it. Said he was going to be there next week, and he and Foley would resolve their differences for the good of TNA. Why was he on the phone? I don't know. Why could he not be at his own show? Uh, he was busy. Why was this acting so poor? <laughs> Jared's delivery here was not as good as that of Angle and Mick Foley in the prior segment. There was also a bit here right before a very short segment where AJ Styles arrived, dressed for the gay community, I believe, and uh, who should he meet but cute Kip. <laughs> and he asked where Joe was, and Kip gave him some answer, and then going back to hanging whatever artwork he was doing, or whatever the hell he had. Abyss and Kevin Nash in a first-ever meeting. <laughs> who thought this was a good idea, by the way? Who thinks any Kevin Nash match is a good idea? I don't, I don't have an answer. It was acceptable. I was expecting I guess. much. When they announced this match, I panicked. <laughs> <laughs> I could not imagine the horror that would befall me. And you know what? It was fine. It was better than I expected, I'll say that. Until the ref got distracted and Stevie ran in and he tasered Abyss. And they edited in these completely ridiculous sound effects, which yeah. made it even more absurd because the referee was completely unaware. That one man was loudly tasering another man a foot behind him. Yeah. It was so loud we could pick it up at home, over the announcers, over the crowd, over the ring noise, but the referee was oblivious to this electric shocking going on behind him. And then uh, Stevie bailed, and Kevin Nash made a big dramatic cover, and Don West noted, great pin by Nash. <laughs> and then Lauren hit the ring to look at her man, and Stevie on the ramp flashed the taser, and does anyone want to bet that Abyss actually took a real taser shot because he's so fucking stupid. There was smoke. It's possible. It's fake, everyone. It's fake. You are not going to convince anyone otherwise. The best you will do is convince people that you're a fucking idiot. Then we had uh, Beer Money come out and cut a promo about how they were the best team in the world. Gave some credit to Team 3D, called them legends. Said so he'd be happy to offer them a rematch anytime, blah, blah, blah. Booker and Steiner erupted. They're, interrupted. They're a new team. One half of Harlem Heat and one half of the Steiners. And we got the usually comically great promo from Mr. Steiner. And uh, anyway, they demanded a title shot. And they also noted that Nash was getting a shot against AJ <laughs> for the Legends title at the pay-per-view. Now, that is a match. Get your cable bill now. At least it, at least with Abyss, it's two big guys. Uh-huh. This is like... AJ fucking Styles is being wasted in a match with Kevin Nash. Yes, they're taking their 
argu- argu- arguably the most talented baby face and putting him in a match where all he will do is bump and sell, maybe come back with a couple of kicks and probably get pinned. So then they said that Booker would be facing, uh, Booker and Scott would both be facing beer money in singles matches later. Apparently Kurt made the decision. I don't know who or why. And then Bub and Devon came out and demanded their shot. And Steiner called them fat asses and told them to fuck off. He said, where's your abs? Well, this was later. He's, first he called them fat asses. I'm sorry. And then Bubba started stuttering. And then Steiner started screaming, show us your abs! That was his comeback. <laughs> show us your abs, you fat fuck! Daphne and Taylor Wilde, 10,000 thumbtacks. I, I, I do want to mention the, the give and take between Beer Money and Steiner and, and, and Booker in that promo was also awesome. So there's a night of good promos on TNA. That's actually why I paused momentarily between that and the you Daphne didn't, match. didn't pause long enough. I'm slow. Daphne and Taylor Wilde in a 10,000 thumbtack match. The thumbtacks, of course, were on a pole. <laughs> so Daphne got the bag, but that's not how you win. So they ended up spread out all over the canvas. And then we had just a fucking awesome TNA moment. So there's a bunch of fucking tacks on the ground. Daphne is in control. And she goes to give Taylor a suplex, I guess, onto the tax. Perhaps her idea was a front suplex, because she's facing the wrong fucking way. So then Taylor does a switcheroo, and she tries to deposit Daphne into the tax with, of all things, a German suplex. Which means, if you do it poorly, you're back is going to be in the fucking tax. More of you than your opponent. And if you do it with great technique, the top of your own fucking head will be in tax. Sure. (laughs) This. They did two, they teased two moves into the tax. A suplex raising the wrong way and a German. Yeah, that went badly. I'm trying to think if I could think of a third one that would be even stupider than those two. Um, what's something that would actually involve your opponent being atop you? Like the, uh, oh, what's it called? That one lucha submission hold where you're on your back. Or Joe's choke. Joe's rear naked choke in the sure. tracks. Yeah, yeah, that, that would be work. a good one. So anyway, uh, definitely so a minute later, thrown in. Yeah. And amazingly, like, no tacks were in her body. She must be made of steel. I, I believe that happened in the pay-per-view, too. The tacks only stuck to her clothing. Amazing, actually. Yes. And so, it's TNA and HD, so they zoomed in to show us that no tax were in her back. Indeed, indeed. Awesome. This whole thing went about three minutes. Yeah. For your women's 10,000 thumbtack match with no build on free TV. We then had another awesome fucking TNA moment. The beautiful people are doing a skit backstage. Velvet is doing a promo about Tara, or Tara, however you pronounce it. They, they seem to switch every week. So... I don't know where she says. What what is what does Tara mean? It must. It's short for tarantula. Tarantula, everybody. Tara, tarantula. So she says this line, and she says, "Maybe you want to be a spider, so you'd have more legs to spread." That was a fucking clever line. But they bleeped out spread, and it took me ten tries to find out what she actually said. I was certain she said you'd have more legs to fuck. That makes no sense. I know, but it's TNA. So, seven seconds. Seven seconds after she comes up with the term tarantula, she screams and looks at Madison, and Madison has a tarantula on her shoulder. So... I don't know if any of you know this, but I like animals. I don't like them enough to have any, but I like them. Go to the zoo all the time. And I like to go to pet stores, like on Saturdays, where they have the adoption day. And they have all the kittens and such that are up for adoption, these tiny little kittens. I like to go in there and I like to look at them and that sort of thing. Because they're so cute. You hold them, you pet them, then you go home and you don't have to worry about them again. Kind of like getting a hooker. But, anyway. So, I go to these pet stores. You are not getting your money's worth, but go ahead. I go to these fucking pet stores, and I never see tarantulas. I don't know where you get a tarantula. But let's just say you could get a tarantula at a fucking pet store. Apparently, Tara, on Thursday afternoon, 
realized that the beautiful people were going to do a promo that evening and talk about her and predicted that Velvet Sky was going to call her Tarantula. She predicted that Velvet Sky was going to say, Tara must be short for Tarantula. So, knowing this in advance, she went to the pet store, she bought a fucking spider, she took it to the impact zone, she waited around backstage until this promo started, which she had predicted in advance, like Yuri Geller, and as soon as the tarantula term came, she surreptitiously, without Madison Rain having any idea whatsoever what was going on, put a spider on her shoulder. Her bare, unclothed shoulder, yes. That is ridiculous. It is. It makes no sense. How and, stupid. And <laughs> Yes, the... the there's the, some things... <laughs> there's some things I can suspend my disbelief for. For example, Hurricane wears a fucking mask. All right? So maybe it really wasn't Gregory Helms in the, in the fucking outfit. Maybe he has a friend who's playing the hurricane to convince people that he is not the hurricane. I can make up stories in my brain. I cannot make up a story ridiculous enough to explain what I saw in this segment. No, you just, what you just said about the pet store. That's apparently what happened. That's too ridiculous for Either me. Either that, or she just carries around tarantulas in general, always prepared to leave them on unsuspecting women's shoulders. But let it be known that... Do you know how <laughs> fucked up I would have to be how many drugs and how much alcohol I would have to consume to not be aware that a furry spider had been placed on my fucking shoulder? Madison didn't even notice until Velvet screamed! Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the segment began with Velvet talking as the crowd was chanting TNA for the action they had just seen, and rather than let lo those wrestlers get over, they had to go to the back with this promo. I guess in total it went about 15 seconds, maybe 20. <laughs> and... Velvet saw the spider, she screamed, the camera panned over, we saw the spider, Madison screamed, but didn't move, the camera zoomed into the spider, commercial. Of course. And what we never, after that? We never, never got a follow-up. Maybe there's a go tarantula loose in the fucking impact zone. Maybe they'll go back next week and Madison will still be sitting in the chair with a spider on her shoulder, too scared to move. This is news! Going back to the gym, imagine if I were coaching and a fucking tarantula was seen. The gym would be evacuated. Yes. 911 would be called. Nobody gave a fuck that there is a giant hairy tarantula in the impact zone on a woman's shoulder. So. So this was really, really stupid. As Granny would say. So anyway. So anyway. Granny, I'm surprised. That no one's even mentioned this yet. Granny is like. She's like the, the human version of TNA. She makes a profound statement and then goes, so anyway, moves on. Never goes back to it. Sure. That's, that is the story of TNA. I'm going to use that from now on all these segments. Team 3D did a thing with Foley yesterday. Slow down. Take a breath. Tongue. My fucking tongue. Team 3D was doing a thing with Foley backstage, and I have no idea what happened in this segment. <laughs> Because I was fixated on the fat security guard. Yes, me too. Okay, the fat security, the fatter one of the two, the one who's about the 500 really pounds. The really fat one. They're doing this deal with Foley and uh, and Team 3D, and they're arguing back and forth. In the background, the fat security guard starts sweating, and he starts kind of holding his chest. He starts to bend over. Then he takes off his sunglasses. Then he's breathing really heavy. Is this fucking guy having a heart attack? Uh, that's what it looked like, yeah. They never made any mention of this whatsoever. No. They never referenced it again on the show. No. And then it was, so anyway, and we moved on. And we never heard from him again. This is a good show! <laughs> a good show. For those of you who signed up for the first time and have never heard the Brian Vinny show before, we are reviewing a good impact. Yeah. This is a good show with mysterious spiders and random pointless heart attacks. Then we I had all pointless, but. Scott Steiner and Robert Rude. Oh, by the way, there was an insider comment in that segment where Foley said, I'm going to do something for you guys that's never been done before for anyone else. And Bubba said, take a shower after your match. 
Get it? Of course not. The comedy is that Bubba Ray is infamous for never showering in front of the boys after the matches. You know, because he's a fucking fat ass. So anyway, we had uh, Angle interviewing JB. Oh, no, sorry. We had the match first. Scott Sander and Robert Roode. I love this match. This was tremendous fun. Robert Roode just was a total baby face. And a great one. Steiner was a, a mean heel. They uh, had a match. They tried really hard. Steiner got tired at the end a little bit, but what can you do? And then suddenly, Scott Steiner pinned Robert Roode out of nowhere with a backslide. Sure. Awesome. <laughs> yes. I love this. It was... It was- he had an interesting move and pinned him. And the challenger set, pinned the champion to set up a title match, supposedly the next pay-per-view. So. I think this was my favorite match on Impact in, like, m- maybe since they debuted. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I love this match so much, but it was so wonderful. Because it was so easy to watch. They didn't overwhelm you with 800 things. They chopped each other a lot. They just had a wrestling match, and a dude pinned another dude with a fucking backslide. Yeah. That's awesome. It required very little of you as a viewer to enjoy. This, this was, was tremendous. Great. I also love the part where Beer Money, of course, has their Beer Money suplex where they do their cheer. And uh, this is a singles match, so Robert Roode was counting on the tr- on the, counting on the crowd who chant beer, and they did. They hit their spot. That was awesome. Angle did an interview with JB and said he was the leader of the mafia. Who cares? JB interviewed. Actually, I do. Oh, I do. Kurt Angle said, Sting's not the leader of the mafia. I am. I believe two months ago, maybe less, I watched a pay per view. Oh, yeah, this is the one I missed. I'm sorry, but regardless. There was a pay-per-view. Sting pinned Kurt Angle. Well, you're missing the point. That That is the point. Yeah. Angle's ignoring that. And the, 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 and the company is ignoring that. Therefore, their own steps have been killed. Well, no. Angle Angle is... No, I, 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 I strongly disagree with you on this, actually. The whole point is Angle did not want to give up power to Sting. Sting wasn't there. There was no one to argue with Angle. He was saying, uh, it's for example, I'm the fucking king of the board. Okay? Okay. If somebody wins and beats me next year, I don't care. I'm I'm the king of the board forever. All right? That's all Angle's doing. He's saying, I am the leader of the mafia. I don't give a fuck what stipulations or what anybody said. I'm the leader. And that played out later on in the show as well. So, I, what? I, they <laughs> shouldn't it be... I'm trying to think of an analogy. The company's role to enforce the steps of their main event. Yeah, but the, the company, there was nobody around. It was a private interview with Kurt Angle. I see. He was trying to put over the point that he didn't give a fuck what anyone said. He considered himself the leader of the mafia. I I'm see. totally fine with this. We had uh, JB interviewing Foley about Jarrett next week, and not much to it. There it was a lot forever. of yelling. I don't, like, I don't like all this yelling. It went on for fucking ever. What an irony that is. Blonde interviewed Eric Young, and... Um, he said he was sick of being the court jester. He said, in this business, there are no friends, only acquaintances. And then Lauren tried to tell him, you're wrong about this business. And I will be the first person to say that I hate how the women get buried in the show at every turn. But if there was ever a time where he should have said, shut the fuck up, Lauren, this was the time. <laughs> Lauren is telling Eric Young about how the business works. Sure. Stop. Got to smarten the young guy up. So anyway, Rhino walked up and it got really stupid. He was upset about this. Eric challenged him to a match next week. Rhino said, why wait? Eric headbutted him and backed off. And then the Navy guy ran up and said, Rhino, don't worry about it. We'll handle it on our time. So Rhino, of course, got mad at him (laughs) for, I guess, trying to, I don't know what, be a voice of reason. (laughs) I have no idea. And he threw him into a wall. (laughs) Well, he threw him into a wall, but he threw him into the wall, and Lord happened to be between him and the wall. It, as soon as he hit Lauren in the wall, it was, so anyway. So anyway. Yeah, this made no sense. I don't know why, why Rhino was being such a dick to everybody. So anyway, Lauren, by the way, got crushed by the Navy guy in a wall. And then, of course, the very next segment is Lauren totally fine interviewing Booker T. That was awesome. Yeah. He ranted in a raid, and then... Uh, I have no idea what he said here. Who cares? Charmel ran up and announced it's her and Jenna at Victory Road. It's on, like, Nick Bone, she announced. It's this was on, great. It's on the pay-per-view. Yeah. You to pay to watch Charmel versus Jenna. Mm-hmm. Okay. So then we had the James Storm Booker T match, which was not as fun as Steiner and Rude. And they worked a while. Charmel gave Booker the beer bottle. He broke it over the back of Storm's head for the DQ. I really hope they're using, like, sugar, sh- fake bottles, because hitting a guy in the back of the fucking head with a beer bottle made of glass, not the smartest idea, but this is not the smartest company. So, anyway, that was that. Storm 1 via DQ. The, the highlight was uh, after Booker T 
hit him with his bottle, got blatantly disqualified. Don West proclaimed he outsmarted him, which I know he's a heel announcer, but wow. AJ came out and did a promo and demanded Joe come out, and he was upset that Joe took the money, screwed him and the fans, blah, blah, blah. And by the way, as they were talking, there were about four fans right across from the hard camera who all had a portion of a sign that they held up on national TV that read, Swerve! Awesome. Yes, great man. AJ wanted to know who'd gotten to his ear. Joe said, I'll let you know at Victory Road. So AJ said, I'm not done talking to you. And Joe said, I'm done talking. And he turned to leave. So AJ, the baby face, of course, jumped in from behind. So the Mafia and Matt Morgan ran out, beat the shit out of AJ, and then Sting's music played, and they all fled in terror. So then the main event was Sting doing a promo, a pretty damn good promo, actually, about how uh, all this shit had been withheld from him, the induction of Morgan into the group, blah, 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 buried all, all the guys, pretty much individually, and then said, you know, Nash, I did expect more from you. And Nash then proceeded to fucking cut a great promo. He said, look around, this bullshit isn't working. It wasn't working under you, and it's working under Angle. He's the champion. This honor and respect thing is bullshit. It's all about the money. We took Jenna's money. We bought off Joe because we couldn't beat him. He said you could make money, or you could make friends in this business, but you couldn't make both. And Sting tried to talk him into uh, joining the good side, and then gave him the bat and said, if you want to hit me, hit me. And as Nash was about to, Sting had a second bat, and he beat him to the punch, and... Started beating everybody up, but Joe got his hands on the bat and beat the shit out of Sting. And uh, they laid him out. So Sting is out of the mafia. He is joining the good guys now. Unless it's a swerve. <laughs> and this was, in fact, the best TV in months. It was, a, it was a very good show. Yes, it was the night of good promos, as I said, between Angle and Foley earlier, and then Beer Money and Steiner and, 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 and Booker, and then here with Sting and Nash, and a, a lot of great passionate delivery going on. I just like that as they were, the announcers were screaming that Sting was out of the Mafia, that he would never be able to get over this. And I thought to myself, you know, the Mafia's in there with Samoa Joe. And what they did to him was much, much worse than what they're doing to Sting right now. Mm -hmm. So maybe they just buy Sting off in a month. Maybe. Maybe. But this was a good show. 